Okay, let's okay. go ahead and get started then. Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the virtual city council meeting for March 17, 2020 for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes uh, for closed session. Can we have a roll call please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council member Bradley. Present. Council member Dida. Here. Council member Ferraro. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria. Here. Mayor Cookshank. I'm here, thank you. Uh, next item, Emily. We have a quorum, Mr. Mayor. And before we move any further, I'd like to announce that this meeting is being held pursuant to executive order number 25-20 issued by Governor Newsom, which allows for council members and staff to participate by virtual meeting. Up next, we have public comments for those wishing to speak on the closed session items. We do not have any requests to speak, therefore we can move to the closed session items announced. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and any who may be watching us streaming, the city council will mute its uh, live broadcast and go into closed session. There are two items on its closed session agenda. The first is one matter of pending litigation to which the city is a party. The title of that litigation is Indian Peak Property and Others versus the City of Rancho Palos Verdes and Others. United States District Court case number two, colon 20-CV-00457. And secondly, the city council will meet in closed session with its labor negotiating representatives uh, to discuss with the city council ongoing labor negotiations with the Rancho Palos Verdes Employees Association. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, with that, we can recess to closed session. All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March 17, 2020 Rancho Palos Verdes City Council meeting. Uh, tonight, we're holding a, a special meeting uh, if we can have a roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Bradley. Present. Council Member Dida. Here. Council Member Ferraro. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria. Here. Mayor Cookshank. Here. Thank you, Emily. Next item. Okay. We have a quorum, Mr. Mayor. Before we move forward, I'd like just to make an announcement that this meeting is being held pursuant to Executive Order N-2520 issued by Governor Newsom, which allows for council members and staff to participate virtual meeting. Next, we have public comments um, and we have no request to speak. Therefore, we can go to our item, which is, to, is for consideration and possible action to adopt a resolution declaring a local emergency in response to the novel coronavirus COVID-19. We have no request to speak on this item. Okay, uh, next item is that the city attorney? Is yes, right? thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we have uh, convened this special meeting to ask the council to consider declaring a local emergency pursuant to the authority conferred upon you by the government code and by your own municipal code. Um, I hope the council's had an opportunity to read a fairly extensive staff report, but the bottom line is that government code section 8558 and uh, RPV municipal code chapter 2.24 allows uh, the city council to declare a local emergency. Um, given the number of declarations of emergency that have ranged from the president of the United States to the governor of the state of California who has now issued three such orders, the latest of which was issued last night, prohibiting um, evictions during the period of a, a, a state emergency. And given further, the local county health department's orders closing various establishments uh, and prohibiting uh, um, uh, meetings of more than 50 persons, uh, we are of the opinion that the city council is warranted and we would recommend that the city council adopt a local declaration of emergency for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes for two reasons. One, declaring a local emergency and activating your 
Emergency Operations <laughs> Center at, 11 th at a level three is a condition preceding to federal and state reimbursements of expenditures which may be incurred in combating the uh, novel coronavirus and the conditions giving rise to the state, county, and local um, uh, declarations of local emergency. And two, um, it gives the city manager acting in his capacity as the director of administrative services, uh, the power to do things like engage in emergency purchases, which can later be ratified by the council, invoking the various force majeure clauses in the city's various contracts to either delay payment on the part of the city or to extend the time to perform on the part of a vendor whose operations are closed uh, because of uh, social distancing. Um, it also gives uh, the local <coughs> law enforcement officers who are our local police department the authority to act under the direction of the director of Emer emergency services to take such actions as are necessary and proper during the course of this emergency. Attached to our staff report is a resolution uh, declaring the local emergency. Uh, the factual predicates for that emergency are recited in the recitals to the ordinance and the specific actions authorized by the Director of Administrative Services are set forth um, in the resolution itself and it remains for the council to consider and take action on it, on it. We would recommend that the council waive for the reading and approve the resolution. And with that, I'll conclude my report unless there are questions. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Any questions from the council? Please raise your hand. I'll... It looks like none of my fellow council members have raised their hand. I, I agree with what the city attorney has said. Um, you know, we've got to be able to activate it to be able to get reimbursed from the federal government. I know that our neighboring cities, uh, both Rolling Hills Estates and Palos Verdes Estates have activated their uh, emergency response as well and declared a, a local emergency. Um, so I, I suggest we do the same. Any further discussion? Uh, no further discussion, Mr. Mayor. I would agree. I think we need to take all appropriate steps to care for our community. And I think this is an important one to take at this time. Very good. Any further comments from my uh, colleagues? I'll move adoption of the resolution declaring a local emergency. I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Council Member Ferraro? Yes. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Council Member Dida? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cookshank? Yes. Thank you, everyone, for putting that together. Okay, very good. So we will adjourn this special meeting and we will reconvene to our regular meeting study session. Is that correct? Correct. <clears throat> okay, anyone have comments or in regards to our study session? Seeing no one has their hands raised, um, we'll, we'll move that without further comment. Looks like nobody has any comments here. Hey, Mr. Mayor, I just I just want to chime in and just let yes. you know that what you're looking at are the tentative agendas. And in light of um, the current situation with COVID-19, some things may change with the, um, the future agenda items. So it's, it's sort of a fluid document at this point. Thank you, Ara. And, and I would also make the comment that, you know, we're doing this meeting tonight virtually. Uh, we understand city business is important, but we also understand safety is number one. So we're taking this unusual step or change for the city to be able to meet virtually. And all the council members are currently in separate safe locations uh, along with our staff members. So with that, I guess we'll adjourn to the regular meeting. Uh, welcome everyone to the Rancho Palos Verdes regular meeting for March 17th, 2020. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Bradley? Present. Council Member Dida? Present. Council Member Ferraro? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? 
Looks like we might have lost him temporarily. It looked like he was having uh, some uh, network issues. I could see his uh, his feed dimming there, so it, he may be trying to get back on. Why don't you ask him to raise his hand if he can hear you with a yes? Well, we have no video feed of him right now. So uh, do we want to just proceed and then he'll probably join us? Okay. I will mark him absent for the time being and I will note his time when he comes back online. Okay. Mayor Cruikshank? Here. Okay. Next item is- We have a quorum. Oh, please go ahead. I was just gonna announce that we do have a quorum. And your next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, if everyone can join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge, pledge of allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the, of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, which it stands one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. all. Our next item is the closed session report. Thank you, Emily. Bill? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and any who are participating with us uh, electronically. Uh, the council had a fairly extensive closed session tonight and not a whole lot of time to conduct it, so my report will be brief. The uh, pending litigation to which the city is a party, Indian Peak versus the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, Federal District Court case number two, colon 20-CV-00457 uh, will be continued to a future council meeting. Time did not permit a meaningful discussion of this item with the council. Um, secondly, the council met in closed session to meet with its labor negotiators regarding labor negotiations with the Rancho Palos Verdes Employees Association. Um, the city council started its discussion of a recent proposal for a new three-year memorandum of understanding from the exclusively represented employee bargaining unit. Uh, but was unable, given the time that was allotted to closed session, to conclude those discussions. So this item will also be continued to a future council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Bill. We appreciate that. Um, next item appears to be mayor's announcements, correct? Mr. Mayor? Yes, please. Um, the mayor pro tem has joined us. Yeah, I see that. Welcome back. Okay. Thank you. I've been having some internet issues, so... Hopefully they stay stable now. Okay, yeah, very good. Don't move around too fast. <laughs> so I've, from a mayor's announcements, this is probably the loneliest happy St. Patrick's Day we've ever had, but I hope everyone is staying in somewhat positive spirits out there. Um, you know, we, it might be a little choppy tonight in our, our meeting, but we did uh, practice this for about an hour and a half today. Um, so think about how much worse it would have been had we not practiced at all. Uh, so that, that's all the announcements I have. Uh, I do want to do the recycler winner for uh, March 17th, actually for March 4th meeting. And one of these people I actually know. So we have two recycle winners for the March 4th, 2020 city council meeting, Babette Sackheim and Caitlin Seif. They each have won a check for $250. Remember, recycle and you may win $250. This is the city's way of saying thank you for recycling. In addition to winning the recycling drawing, these two have also won a personal emergency preparedness kit from the City of Rancho Palos Verdes Emergency Preparedness Division, a $60 value, and I don't know if that includes a roll of toilet paper or not. <laughs> Very good, so next, next item. Next item is the approval of the agenda. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second. Can we have a roll call? Councilmember Guida? Yes. Councilmember Ferraro? Yes. Councilmember Bradley? Yes. Mayor Potem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cookshank? Yes. Motion passes. Up next, we do have public comments for items not on the agenda. Um, and we do not have. We do not have any requests to speak. Um, therefore, we can move on to the city manager report. Okay. All right. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the city council and uh, the public. Um, this this is this is a new um, experience for for the city, you know, going virtual. And so I appreciate the public and the council's um, patience as we kind of navigate through this process. So for um, my first item, I'm going to report out on the 2020 census. As you know, um, the 2020 census is underway. If you haven't received one already, you should soon receive an invitation at home to complete the census. Once it arrives, you should respond for your home online by phone or by mail. Over 5 million people have responded online to the 2020 census. Currently, the planned completion date for data collection for the 2020 census is July 31st. However, that date can and will be adjusted if necessary as the COVID outbreak evolves in order to achieve a complete and accurate count. I got my envelope and I'm sure many of you are getting your envelope. I would stress here that um, if you complete the, the, um, the answers and submit by April 1st, hopefully you won't have to hear from the, um, anyone knocking on your door asking for a response. The next item, thank you, is Alert South Bay. And you know, in light of everything that we're going, that's going on right now, um, this is clearly a very important application that we are really trying to push out and get the public to respond to. So just as a reminder, Rancho Palos Verdes and 12 other South Bay cities have launched Alert South Bay. It's an opt-in regional emergency notification system that sends notifications via email, text message, cell phone, and landlines to users, and users are encouraged to subscribe to receive alerts from multiple South Bay cities. It's, it's very interesting with what, what's going on currently. Um, I know a lot, of, if you've subscribed, you're probably getting a lot of messages from a variety of, of South Bay cities that are participating, the 12 cities. We're, we're still kind of working this out. So, so be patient with us as we're trying to navigate through using this system and making sure we're keeping the public informed in regards to updates, especially in light of this current uh, situation. And that's gonna lead me into giving you an update on COVID 19. I mean, there's a lot of information that's being pushed out um, from not only the city, but, but at the county level, the state level, and the federal level. So I just want to give uh, the council and the public an update from the city's perspective on things. Um, as of today, we got, count, we got notification that there are 144 confirmed cases of COVID-19 across Los Angeles County. Um, those numbers are expected to increase, and it's based on on, on the, um, the county um, affirming some of the cases that are being reported. We're closely monitoring the situation and sharing updates as, as, as they come forward. I encourage the public to continue to subscribe to our listservs. What we're trying to do is push out community updates um, daily so that the community can, can get a summary of where things are at um, on a daily basis. And of course, as information comes forward, we are um, pushing any pertinent information out as, as soon as we get that information. I wanna clarify that the total number of confirmed cases that the Department of Public Health shares every day reflects a moment in time and may not include cases confirmed by commercial labs that just haven't been shared yet. So that's really important because I know we're hearing um, it based from some listservs that there's reports of uh, positive testing, but it still has to be confirmed. So that's why that number is a very fluid number and may change. Um, and as you know, from, from the city's perspective um, and what we're doing in, in out of an abundance of caution, for at least the remainder of March, there are a few measures that we have implemented. First off, I wanna highlight that city hall and all park public buildings are closed to the public and um, all recreational activities, classes, and events at city facilities have also been canceled. Um, we, as of yesterday, we also, um, we canceled all future meetings that are scheduled for the month of March. So that includes the Finance Advisory Committee, the IMAC, the Civic Center um, Advisory Committee, even the Planning Commission meeting. All those advisory committee and commission meetings have been canceled for for March as we continue to navigate and monitor what's going on. Um, the city intends to um, continue to provide primary essential city services that are necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our community and our city employees. To facilitate these measures, 
Um, what we've done is all non-essential staff will be working remotely. So that's gonna be implemented as of tomorrow. Uh, we'll still have um, certain members here at City Hall to answer calls, address any emails, and, and staff will be working remotely. And so there'll be a lot of coordination. In fact, over the weekend, um, we were pushing out information and that was all being coordinated remotely. We were all at different locations. So it's, it's achievable. We think we can do it and still minimize the disruption in services. We just ask that the community remain patient and cooperative with us as we we um, can't give full services. We're gonna have to give uh, some um, modified types of services to the public, but we will do our best to be responsive and get things through. Um, as we we took action on our, our special meeting, we activated um, a proclamation of a local emergency. And what, what was decided by that is it enables the city to have access to a variety of resources and as well as collect um, and be reimbursed for any of the costs that we're incurring um, in light of this incident. Um, over the weekend, we did um, activate at a level three, the emergency operations center. That is the lowest level. It just allows us to improve communication with um, various government agencies, as well as the sheriff's department. It assigns key personnel to the um, EOC, the emergency operations center. So there's a constant communication 24 hours a day. Um, a couple of things that I'm also going to highlight is I know there's a lot of concern about the seniors and, and, and members of the public that have limited access. I want to stress, and you can see this on the screen, there are volunteer efforts being coordinated by the school district. Um, actually, uh, board member Linda Reed is, and I apologize for the misspelling there, but um, she, there's an email up on the screen and you can contact her to see if, if you need help and she can connect you with volunteers. And I also wanna stress, because we're hearing a lot of it in the news about the shortage or people's um, perception that there's gonna be a shortage of food or water. Um, there's no shortage of food and supplies, no impact on the quality or supply of tap water. And there should be no disruption with what we're going through with, with water or sewer service. So that said, um, I'm going to uh, give you a drum roll here. And we, uh, the mayor and the mayor pro tem um, taped a public service announcement in regards to COVID-19. And I'm gonna hand it over um, to, to air that, that it's like about a minute long and we're, we're gonna air it now. This is the first time the public gets to see this. So- No, Mr. Mr. City Manager. Yes. Can, can I add just two things to this fluid report you're giving that before you roll the uh, video. The, the governor has now in the last two days issued two more executive orders, one that will be of interest to all residents of Rancho Palos Verdes, especially renters, is executive order number N-28-20, which prohibits price gouging and which prohibits evictions that would occur during the course of a state or local emergency as a result of the inability to pay rent during the course of this local emergency. So residents who are currently laid off or unable to work, uh, who are worried about making their next month's rent, uh, be advised that the governor has taken action to protect you from being evicted for your inability to pay rent, at least for the next 30 days. Thank you. And so I'm gonna hand it over and see if um, Nathan, which is another room. There we go. We don't have sound. And I don't remember the words, so I can't, I can't <laughs> repeat it. <laughs> and I can't read lips. So um, th this, while, while this is airing, this public service announcement will start going live on RPV TV so the public can can hear it and see it. It's just to reinforce some of the the measures that we've got we're, we're implementing in terms of social distancing and some other um, measures to help protect ourselves and what's happening. There's a lot of coordination with the four cities on the peninsula. In fact, I think there's a great amount of communication occurring and being pushed out by all four cities collectively. And they, they probably have the volume on the feed, possibly.
And these are the, the, the uh, social platforms that we encourage the public to monitor in order to get up-to-date information on this, this um, pandemic. And of course, there's the website and we continue, like I said, pushing out daily um, community updates. Thank you. Nathan, next slide, please. And, and, and again, these are just some of um, the, the preventive measures that you could do to avoid um, contracting the, the COVID-19 um, virus. And of, of course, there's the, um, the social distancing. And for the last slide, I think I wanna leave on, on a lighter note here and just remind um, the public that we're going through the process of accepting nominations for the mayor's honorees. These are residents who have made notable achievements and innovations in entrepreneurship, the arts, science, and technology. Um, we're asking that um, you submit applications from the public. The only requirement is that the honoree has to be a current resident of Rancho Palos Verdes. The applications are available on the city's website at rpvca.gov. And that concludes my report for this council meeting. Thank you so much, Ara. And just to follow on on the honorees, that there's so many amazing people in our city that we do want to honor. So please, if you have a, a family member or neighbor that you believe should be uh, acknowledged, please let us know. And then a couple other things. I We were showing on the uh, PSA that uh, school board member Linda Reed, she, uh, I actually got a request from a, a, a someone that runs some of our assisted living and within 15 minutes, I connected her with Linda and Linda was already helping uh, connecting people to help some seniors get food. So we have amazing residents out there and people in our community that are out there to help. And I finally wanna say to Ara and our entire staff, they have literally been working around the clock to make sure that information is getting out to our community. And for that, I'm, I'm great, uh, very grateful for all of the work that they've done. So Ara, thank you for that. Yeah, they, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. I, I should, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, give credit to um, the staff, especially over the weekend that we were working on, on collecting information, pushing out updates, both Saturday and Sunday um, to Megan Barnes, to Kit Fox, and to Jesse, our new um, uh, emergency preparedness analyst. I mean, it's a, a, the, the silver lining in all of this. I mean, he just started with the city two weeks ago and, and, and we're very grateful that he's here because he, he is very versed in, in these issues and understands um, emergency preparedness, not only from the local level, but also the state and federal level. And he's really helped us. He helped us activate the EOC on Saturday. So a big shout out to those individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Laura. And Mr. Mayor, if I may add, um, I, I want to I want to second your commentary. Um, this has really been a minute by minute evolving situation, public health situation, and I'm so proud uh, of the reaction of our city staff and the work that they've done. As the mayor noted, um, really impressive, and you should have every confidence in the people around this community that are taking action. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, th think about this. R is a brand new city manager. He's dealing with this amazing crisis that's going on. And so we couldn't be prouder. Thank All you. Right. N next item, please. Our next item is the consent calendar. Late correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting regarding items E and I, and we do not have any requests to speak. Okay, before you guys make a motion, I, I do want to pull consent item H. Are there any other items that other members would like to pull? I'd like to pull uh, item L. Okay. Any anyone else? Item L H and L. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Is there a motion? I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. W without items H or L. Without items HRL. 
Okay, there's a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Council Member Ferraro? Yes. Council Member Dida? Yes. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cruikshank? Yes. Motion passes. We can now move to um, our regular business item, the first item. Give me just one moment here. Our first item is for consideration and possible action to review the effectiveness of public parking measures at Upper Portuguese Bend Reserve, Iliorum Reserve, and Del Cerro Park. Lake correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting regarding this item, and we do not have any requests to speak at this time. Okay, thank you. Staff report from Ms. Lozano. Be patient with us as we switch screens here. And Does that appear all right? Yep. Okay, great. So this item is parking solutions near the Portuguese Bend Reserve. Uh, Billy Orr. Katie, hold on just a second. You're not sharing your screen. We can see you, but we can't see your screen. Yeah, give, give them a second. We don't see your screen yet. The, the actual presentation we don't see. We did for just a minute. Yeah, and then it changed to the full view. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're fast. Modern technology. Hey, we're breaking new ground. Yes, we are. I really like this. Who said that? Dave? Yes. Councilman Bradley. Dave, you need a key light. Yeah, I know. I'll get it for next time. All right. Okay. I can see it now. There we go. All right. Take it away. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so this item is parking solutions near the Portuguese Bend Reserve, Billy Orm Reserve, and Del Cerro Park. Here is an overview of the area. The area shaded in green is the 1,400-acre Palos Verdes Nature Preserve, broken into 12 individual properties. Also on this screen in blue is Del Cerro Park. And the area encircled in yellow is the focus of tonight's staff report. This is the primary parking and access for two of the city's very busy reserve properties, Billy Orm and Portuguese Bend, and also Del Cerro Park. This area encircled in yellow sees approximately 240,000 preserve visitors each year. Here's a closer look at that neighborhood and the preserve access points. The neighborhood is shown shaded in pink. It's made up of four HOAs, Island View, Rancho Crest, Del Cerro, and at the bottom is Park Place. Uh, the red circles show the primary access points into the nature preserve. On the left is Rattlesnake Trail. That's the primary access into Philly Orm Reserve. On the right is Burma Road Trail. That's the primary access into Del, uh, excuse me, into the Portuguese Bend Reserve. So the nature preserves have seen an increase, a substantial increase in use over the past approximately 10 years, largely due to uh, word spread through social media. And this increase in use has had an adverse impact on this neighborhood. Some of the key concerns have been traffic safety, quality of life issues, and nighttime use of the area. So staff has been working with these four HOAs on solutions to parking issues and quality of life issues over the past few years. And these are the four key traffic programs that staff has implemented in the area. And staff is gonna go through them next one by one in more detail. 
They are the neighborhood parking program, prohibiting parking on parts of Crenshaw Boulevard and Crest Road, implementing nighttime parking restrictions, and the recreational parking permit program on Park Place. The first program was the neighborhood parking permit program implemented in 2015. Three of the HOAs implemented this program. Uh, what this program does is it allows only homeowners and their guests to park within these res residential streets, uh, as well as the homeowners guests. So this program was successful. This program significantly reduced the amount of uh, members of the public driving through these neighborhoods or trying to find public parking in these neighborhoods to access the preserve. Here's the second and the third program implemented. The second was restricting parking on parts of Crenshaw Boulevard and Crest Road. And the third was prohibiting nighttime parking. Uh, so the parking that was prohibited on Crenshaw Boulevard and Crest Road is shown on this slide in red. It was prohibited either by painting curbs red, installing signage or a combination of the two. And essentially what this action did was push a lot of the public parking out of the residential neighborhood and down Crenshaw Boulevard. Uh, the nighttime parking restrictions were implemented in two locations. The first location is those 40 marked parking spaces that are closest to the reserve properties. And the second location where we prohibited nighttime parking is on Park Place. Uh, overall, the neighborhoods have shared that these uh, parking programs, traffic programs have helped uh, enormously by pushing the, the public parking out of the neighborhood. However, conditions are existing according to the HOAs and these are uh, mostly the existing conditions are unsafe and difficult driving conditions, the volume of visitors coming to this area and noise, especially early in the morning. And the fourth major program we implemented was on Park Place. Certain areas of Park Place were red curbed, shown in red on this slide. So no parking is allowed here at any time except for emergency vehicles. Also on Park Place, staff implemented the recreational parking permit program. Uh, so this was done in the area shown in green. These are 16 parking stalls that originally were open to the public, all members of the public. In 2019, these 16 stalls were converted to recreational permit parking stalls, which means that only particular people can park here. And those particular people are Listed here, a resident who has obtained a permit through the city can park in these 16 stalls. They can park for a maximum of three hours and they are not allowed to park overnight. Park place guests can park in these 16 stalls for a maximum of 72 hours. And city and land conservancy vehicles can park here while on duty. Uh, the neighbor, uh, the HOA has reported that this has reduced um, quality of life issues on Park Place. However, conditions are still quite difficult on Park Place. And here are some of the continued issues they're, they're feeling on Park Place. A continued congestion, difficulty accessing property, sometimes aggressive visitors, and cars parking within these 16 stalls without the appropriate permit. And here is staff's recommendation. It is to receive and file the status update on the effectiveness of the city's public parking restrictions in the area. And two, for city council to consider additional measures to minimize public parking impacts to the area and to direct staff to explore these measures for future consideration by city council. And that's the end of staff's presentation. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Katie. Any questions of staff? I have a question. Please, Councilwoman Ferraro. I wanted to ask Katie about the uh, park place permit uh, parking because I was up there today and I saw three different cars parked there that had no permits. What is being done for enforcement of the fact that we have permitted parking? Enforcement is currently provided by LA County Sheriff's Department. Uh, they rely heavily on their volunteers on patrol, and they also respond to calls for service in the area. We've also implemented a new park ranger program that's now active, 
and park rangers will be able to uh, augment that enforcement effort. There were empty places, and I don't know how long the people were going to stay, but if they're, if they're only supposed to park there with permits, it seems like we should be enforcing it. There were a lot of people parked on uh, Cress, no, on Crenshaw and walking in. Is there any thought to increasing the, you know, changing the red mark curb to allow more parking? Or I know that some people have said that, that the very act of uh, putting the curbs red made a difference in people um, in the neighborhood, for the people in the neighborhood. But it, it still seems like there are more people wanting to go into the park or the preserve than we have places for. It's true that parking on holidays and weekends with especially good weather, it will extend down Crenshaw, sometimes all the way to Crest Ridge. Um, it's a difficult situation. Parking wasn't originally planned for the capacity of people trying to access the property. Uh -huh. um, but neighbors have thanked the city for improving the quality of life by pushing that parking out of the residential neighborhood and down further down Crenshaw. And I may add that the the red curbs that you see out there will uh, um, evolve to what, what what it is now. I mean, it started in in different areas. We phased it out and really tried to assess how effective the red curbing was. And so, what you see there now is, is a result of numerous discussions at past council meetings on on how to minimize the impacts to the neighborhood while still providing. Um, certain access into the preserve. And as, as, as Katie had mentioned, I mean, th there have been numerous occasions where you saw parking that went all the way up to Crest Road intersection near St. John Fisher. And, and the unintended consequences of that and the impacts to, to pedestrian and vehicular safety in that area as well. And one, and one other thing is, in terms of the enforcement, we can definitely um, reach out to the sheriff's department and ask them to patrol that area more often. I mean, one of the things that we're going to see uh, in response to the COVID-19 is, is an increased um, sheriff presence um, around the, the city and the peninsula. And so it, it's, it's not that far for them to just reach out in that area and drive by and make sure that those who are parking in those spaces have the permits. Mm -hmm. And they get those permits at City Hall, right? Yes. Have they got, excuse me, have they got uh, any history of uh, the citations for the illegal parking? Uh, Captain Powers, I believe, has some information. Um, I'm not sure he'll be able to provide that tonight. He is working on that for us. We have some limited information uh, since January 2020. The Sheriff's Department has received approximately 16 calls for service in that area. Um, they aren't able to respond to all service calls. They prioritize the calls coming in based on the situations they're dealing with. Uh, but those calls, in addition to regular patrols in the area, have resulted in 44 citations. On, uh, I'm sorry, 41 parking citations on Park Place. Two additional citations within the neighborhoods. Since January 2020, we do have those statistics. Thank you. Yes, uh, Captain Powers. Yes, if I can add to that, um, I did some research from uh, January 1st of 2019 up until today. And so uh, one of the concerns that was brought to my attention was the fact that we're not enforcing laws out there. Um, and just to, uh, through my research, I determined there were 29 observation calls, which are self-generated calls by my deputies without a call for service from the community, uh, in which contributed to the citations. Um, I'm not able to provide a number of citations in 2019 because when my volunteers go out there and enforce parking issues out there, uh, their activity is not documented in our computer system. And so I, I can't track that. Uh, what I was able to track is the 26 calls from deputies. Several of them did result in citations. And to date, 
Um, there's between 43 and 46 citations that were issued from January 1st of this year um, up until today. And so, uh, I, like I said, that we are enforcing that. Um, and I'm not counting the calls for service that are generated by the uh, residents in the community. Question. Uh, and the volunteers uh, issue citations? Yes, they do. Thank you. I have a question for you, Katie. Um, you know, obviously the park place has always been kind of become the new hotspot. Uh, what, what do you think, what do you think could be done? I think we need to continue working with that HOA. We recently converted the 16 public parking spots to recreational permit parking just in 2019. I think the continued assessment See how this may perhaps beefing up the signage a bit, strengthening the signage, continuing communication with them might be our best steps forward. Oh, those are very good. And let me ask uh, Ara or Elias: it is can the signage be beefed up or more pronounced so that people clearly know that it's only for recreational permit parking and not for the general public? Are you referring to those 17 spaces, right, um, well, along Park Place? Right. I think the problem is, and she had a slide on it that, that showed um, kind of the um, illuminated message sign that said about the parking, but that wasn't as obvious. And I think I've read a few correspondence where the signage doesn't seem to really deter people from heading down. Because I think the problem seems to be people don't know, they go down that cul-de-sac to kind of wait around for open spots and they're blocking driveways and that. So I wonder if there's a way in which uh, uh, they don't even make it that far without having to put full gates in that that we've talked about before, but maybe more signage that doesn't, deters them to head down Park Place. Right. And, and, and what I would suggest we do is if we're going to add some signage and I hear you what you're, you're, um, indicating is maybe having a sign right at the um, the, the intersection there yes. that, that notifies drivers that, that this is permit parking only, so avoids them from turning in there. What I'd like to do is if we go down that path is work with the HOAs there to make sure, you know, we strike a balance that we don't want to have a proliferation of signs everywhere that changes the character of the neighborhood. So, But I, I, I'm certain we can come up with a sign size as well as um, language to to kind of help deter cars from turning in that intersection. Okay, and, and also um, I've seen this in other communities where they have the, the gate arm that when you drive up to it, it actually opens, but if you see it from the street, it looks like the gate arm's down, so it's not accessible. Is that allowed in our city uh, to have something like that where you have a physical gate that's or a gate arm that's down and then it doesn't actually come up until you get drive up next to it. So that that would fall under the same category as gating that street. And since it's a public street, we wouldn't be able to put the arm there because of the reasons identified in the staff report. E even if it activates when you drive up to it? Um, would it just, act, so you're saying it would just be there um, as sort of this optics that it's 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 gated, but it would actually work for any vehicle, correct? Yes, yes, and I've seen that in other communities like South Pasadena and that where if you see it from the street, it looks like there's a gate down and you can't get in, but the residents and the emergency people all know that you could just drive right up to it and activate some lifts. I would, I would, I would ask that we, if that's an in interest of the council, we'll go back and explore that. I couldn't really chime in on the legality of that and we probably want to talk to the sheriff's department but I, I hear what you're saying so we'd have to look into that okay any other questions from the council uh just just one question uh, i know that it's mentioned in the staff report that the gates for uh burma road and rattlesnake trail is there an update on that at this time those gates are currently in the capital improvement plan for a city council to consider at an upcoming date. They were approved by city council in 2018 and 2019. All HOAs support them. 
Uh, the project was put out to bid by Public Works in October of last year. However, Public Works received no bids on the project. Um, so unfortunately, the project was slowed, but they are in the capital improvement project plan for City Council consideration. Yeah, I would just say I, I appreciate the the steps in the process, uh, but from the January approval, I think of from a year ago of, of the plan to institute the gate uh, to October bids, it just seems like a long time. So I would just continue to emphasize that uh, hopefully we can do this a little more expeditiously and the community's been waiting for that. But Aside, I would just comment that um, staff and the HOAs have done a great job on this. I mean, I think that the solutions were really a collective effort over time. And I think we've got some good feedback affirming that the steps that have been taken have made a big impact. So um, I think there's some, been some good points related to uh, informing the work. And so I think we're in a good spot. Modifying any of our current plan, I continue to believe uh, that opportunity park may be very the city for the preserve, which I know we thought about, and I know it's on our uh, our goals plan for this year to get a comprehensive preserve parking plan in front of us. So I look forward to that, and with that, I'll go ahead and uh, make the motion to uh, receive and file. Okay. Do a second. Second. Okay, any further comment? Okay, roll call. Council Member Dida? Yes. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Council Member Poirot? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cruikshank? Yes. Motion passes. Next time. We can now move to our next item. For consideration and possible action to develop a citywide 5G small wireless facilities master deployment plan. The correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting and we have no request to speak at this time. Ooh. Is that me? No, I believe. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Director Sassoon is trying to log on Before. to give his report. I thought he knew what I was talking about. Okay. Lucas is heading down, IT is heading down to help. No, no family um, photos on this one? <laughs> He was on a moment ago. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's a busy person. If somebody's typing, they might want to hit mute. That's me. Okay. Or don't type so fast. <laughs> you know, Khrushchev, when we get this done, can we have like a quick five minute recess uh, uh, while we get this set up? Uh, sure. If you guys want to just do it right now, that would be great. Okay. Uh, Emily, can we have a five minute recess? There you go. I think we're good to go. We, we're good to go. Okay, Dave, are you wanna, okay? Okay. Do you still want to recess? Uh, I don't know, did we just lose people? Uh, I'm back. Okay. Um, no, let's go ahead and, Dave, are you okay or do you need? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. I'm just gonna provide a briefing for this item. Here's our friend Charles Etter. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. This next item is to discuss the a possible action to develop a citywide sure. 5G. Charles, you need to share your screen. There is no formal presentation for this. Oh, okay. 
So I'm just a um, um, I'm just gonna summarize the staff report. No problem. Five G small wireless facilities master deployment plan. Um, just to give a brief history, the idea of a cellular deployment master plan was discussed uh, back in July 2019 by the Planning Commission. In August of 2019, the Planning Commission unanimously agreed that this master plan uh, was in the city's best interest. Uh, it would help speed up the permitting process for these facilities and uh, it would be an incentive for the wireless network carriers for that. Uh, Councilman Bradley brought this item forward to the Planning Commission as a City Council action item today. Um, for some uh, five, uh, small wireless facilities master deployment plan, um, some steps in doing that is to develop a, a, or perform a, mass, a benchmark drive test for signal strength, um, perform field surveys to find out where the least intrusive location is and the preferred locations in the city and conducting public workshops. So that's all I have for uh, the idea to, and a possible action to develop such a 5G small wireless master deployment plan. All right, thanks Charles. Any uh, questions for Charles? Okay. Dave, do you wanna make some comments? I'm gonna make a motion. There, there was no public comments, correct? No. Okay, I just forgot to ask about that. Okay. Uh, sure, any any discussion or you just wanna go right into a motion? It's okay to go to a motion. Go for it, Dave. I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to develop a 5G uh, master plan as recommended in the conclusion of the staff report. Second. Second. Okay, I, I have some comments. I, I think this idea is excellent. Um, you know, having been on the planning commission myself and knowing how important uh, uh, making sure that we do these antennas, whether it's 4G, 5G, doing them correctly and getting uh, neighborhood input and having a plan for it. Um, I mean, I, to me, it, I, I, I don't know what service you guys have, but I lose calls all the time on the Hill um, and we need to be just doing better anyhow. And so for us to understand what we have so we can do some pushback against these carriers would be good as well. So Dave, I really appreciate you, you bringing this forward. It's, it's a great idea. Thank you, Mayor Kruschenk. Any further discussion, Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, no, no, further. well, let me just make one comment and, and agree and say I commend Councilman Bradley. I think this is a great example, this dynamic obviously that we all talk about uh, between us and local governments in the state trying to solve problems. Um, this is a complex issue. I like seeing the uh, the proactive leadership of local government to try to deal with issues. And uh, so I think this is just really in that likeness. I think it's uh, an opportunity for us to set the tone with the way in which we want to see in our vision uh, how we would incorporate a 5G technology onto the onto community in a way that, that fits the character of our city. So Dave, uh, thanks for your leadership on uh, bringing this forth. Thank you. Any further comments? Yes, Councilwoman Ferraro. I just wanted to say, I think we're lucky to have someone of, of the expertise that Dave has on the council. And I'm really glad he brought this forward because I think we'll be ahead of the game making a plan. Very because good. Thank you. you know, calls do get dropped all over the place now, and maybe we can get in ahead of the curve. Yes, well well said. Okay, with that, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, can we have a roll call? Councilmember Bradley? Yes. Councilmember Dida? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Ferraro? Oops. Well, Councilwoman Ferraro votes yes. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. And Mayor Cruikshank? Yes. Motion passes. And if any on the council need to take a break, just let me know. Um, it's been a long day already. Uh, Councilman Bradley, would you like to take a, a five or 10 minute break? Five minute would be outstanding. Okay, let's please take a five minute break. Um, let's be back at 8.20.
Okay. Okay, so we're reconvening. Uh, next item, please. Our next item is for consideration and possible action to review a report regarding the additional, the addition of an air show event to the city's 4th of July event. There are no requests to speak at this time. Okay, very good. Um, any questions of staff about what's being proposed? I, I would say that this is an intriguing idea. I would, oh, we do have a staff report. We do. Corey's link. Yes. Corey's going to present the item. Okay. Sorry about that, Corey. No problem. Let's see your good stuff. <laughs> It'll be short and sweet. <laughs> okay, I'll start. I'll start straight away. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, this is in, in response to a December public comment uh, and subsequent request to look into the possibility of an air show or flyover type event. Uh, through the through the council contacts. Through the council contacts, I met with Dennis Lord. He's the chairman of the Aviation Commission for the County of LA. Uh, Mr. Lord provided me with an education on, on these types of events. While I have 30 years of experience, but they're all land-based, um, but his are all up in the sky. So uh, I definitely got taken to school on this and he was a wealth of information. Mm -hmm. However, one thing that I did find out was that there are two types and uh, there, the, there's so many varieties and so many things to consider uh, even before you even start dis discussing costs. Uh, on an air show, which is typically like going down to Miramar or a Fleet Week and that kind of thing where you look up in the sky, they're doing all kinds of things. Um, again, those things can, it, it will vary considerably as, as it pertains to the number, uh, the location, where can you do it? Is it approved? Are the types of aerobatics, you, acrobatics you have? Um, we do have actually an acrobatic area, a practice acrobatic area located off of Point Vicente but it's not ideal for viewing from up here at City Hall. Um, it is more costly than flyovers because you're dealing with individual acrobatics and, and different types of uh, uh, owners and different types of plane. Um, there are FAA waivers that are typically, typically required and uh, we'd have to run this through the FAA to get their approval. Um, in this, and again, I think if we did anything, I would recommend and we, I think it would be required to hire a aerial coordinator. Uh, in order to facilitate all this. Now a flyover is your basic flyover, much like at the Super Bowl when they come flying over at the, right before the national anthem. Um, it's simpler than an air show. It can be combined with one. Um, however, it can be one or multiple aircraft. Uh, it can include formation overflights, flag banner tows, or parachute jumps. Again, an aerial coordinator plan would be required, uh, as well as the FAA review and approval. <coughs> Again, was real rough, but it could be anywhere between eight and fifteen thousand dollars, depending on how many and for how long. Uh, some of the challenges and the considerations of looking this type of an event was during an air show. It's the ingress, egress concerns, limited parking availability, impacts on neighborhoods. Uh, our Fourth of July celebration already attracts twenty five hundred to three thousand people, and we have a, a heck of a time getting people up and down. Um, we have to shuttle people up from PVIC to come up here, much like Whale of a Day, where we shuttle people from up City Hall down to PVIC. So my concern there as well is uh, having our, our coast or our bluffs inundated with folks as well. Um, on a flyover, this could augment our uh, existing event and it could be just a part of it, as opposed to an air show where people would be lining the bluffs and trying to look at what is going on over the ocean. All the acrobatics would have to take place over the ocean. Um, again, with the flyover, we really wouldn't see a significant attendance increase because it would be a part of it. We could throw in a static air, uh, aircraft display, whether it's a helicopter or what have you, that we could put at our, on our current helipad. In discussing with CJPIA, our insurance agent, our insurance authority, uh, they recommend against these. Uh, there's a high level of, expo uh, of exposure um, they do see, as, as most insurance, sees the uh, uh, worst case scenario. $30 million of aircraft liability coverage is recommended. Uh, they caution that losses would concede that amount of what the city is, is responsible for. Uh, far less risk with, uh, with flyovers. And uh, we, they would turn up the uh, requirements on it as far as each plane that was involved, whether it's a flyover and or a, an acrobatic uh, uh, event. 
event, aircraft maintenance records, pilot trainings, uh, an age of aircraft, and basically a thorough background check on the aircraft and that uh, pilot. So again, this is something that uh, there's a lot of factors to be involved with here, um, whether it's a, 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 a flyby or flyover or a, a, an acrobatic show. And uh, either way, we'd have to go through CJPIA. And uh, again, the cost, we can limit those costs down a little bit if there is specific direction that the council wants to give us. This concludes my, <laughs> excuse me, this concludes my report. And I'm just looking for um, a little bit more direction on how the council would like to, to run with this. Thank you, Corey. Any questions of Corey? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councilman yeah. Dyke. Uh, just a little background. I was uh, director of the Torrance Airfare Association where we held uh, air shows for quite a while. And when the uh, airport built more hangars and we lost the parking, we had something very limited. But in each case, the amount of work and the number of volunteers necessary to put that together was outstanding. The cost was high, and I agree with... Uh, and the fact that that cost is going to be high, especially for aerobatic shows. I was wondering whether or not anybody had contacted the city of Torrance because the aircraft would have to be based there uh, since we don't have an airport other than the health pad. Uh, and they may have a lot of requirements for the kind and type of aircraft, as well as special provisions for them to be able to take off and circulate, uh, that sort of thing. One of the things that helped defray our cost was that we usually had a B-17 there and we uh, offered rides in that. Again, very special insurance, but uh, the cost for that helped to defray some of it. Torrance also subsidized it uh, to some degree, but uh, all in all, it was a very, very expensive both from a manpower and a dollar standpoint for an air show. The flyover is uh, a lot cheaper, but still uh, will take a lot of coordination with a lot of agencies to make sure it goes well. So I just had those comments where they had talked to the city of Torrance about any requirements they might have at the airport. Actually, Mr. Dennis Lord was very very aware and very in tune with what city of Torrance is, is doing down there at their airport. And uh, we, he, he just said there would have to be coordination throughout, um, throughout this uh, South Bay, uh, if and when we do uh, if propose any or apply for any kind of uh, flyover and or aerobatic display. So he was uh, very well in tune. Um, again, I, I haven't spoken to the city of, or spoken to the city of Torrance uh, personally, um, but I'd take it at, at, with him, with our aerial plan coordinator, he would work that through them. My fear with, uh, or not fear, my concern is that, uh, I mean, I appreciate the fact that you guys had a, a large plane to give rides on uh, and to kind of uh, make some money in that manner. Uh, we really couldn't line a large, land a large plane up here. Uh, we could with a helicopter, just thinking forward. However, um, part of the reasons we stopped doing helicopter rides at uh, during our 4th of July in years past is because of uh, uh, our neighbors and uh, making sure that we're not uh, aggravating them. But Terraneo was a big factor too, as uh, they were saying it, it, it impacted some of their events with constant flyovers of helicopters. Well, the flyovers out over the channel where there is an aerobatic region established uh, would be far enough away and quite visible from uh, along the shoreline. But then the, the logistic problem and the cost is something that I'm not sure we're capable of handling at this point. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I have a few comments. Yes, please. I'm worried about whether we should even undertake a project of this magnitude at this point in time. We're not even guaranteed we're going to have our usual 4th of July celebration. And it appears to be very expensive. Well, I know it's very expensive for what we would get out of it. Um, and I don't think we necessarily need to add that cost to the 4th of July at this time. Okay. 
Any other comments? So I'm going to make a few comments. I um, I agree with that sentiment, Barbara. Um, I think still I would be interested in exploring uh, maybe some type of joint flyover type event with uh, Green Hills because Green Hills already does the coordination for that. And, you know, I, I think the amazing thing about our peninsula is, is that it was built on by the aerospace industry. Um, That's true. So, so it would be a really amazing tribute. Uh, but I agree that the timing of spending excess money on something like an air show probably would not be appropriate. But I, I would be interested in seeing either if uh, they could add to their flyover flight pattern to make a whole loop around the peninsula during the Memorial Day event, because they're already going through all the clearances. Um, and maybe it's not that much more difficult to instead of just fly straight and then straight over, maybe they could do a loop around or something. Um, and then our residents know that during Memorial Day, they get an opportunity to see some of our different aircraft uh, like we do it at uh, Green Hills when we're there. Um, also, there's Fleet Week that goes on now every year, and that, that that's probably a more difficult ask because that's now the U.S. military you got to go talk to. But I, I would at least ask the staff potentially to to reach out to Green Hills to see if there's an opportunity to just do a slight expand on what they currently do to to so the whole hill can appreciate those aircraft. Do you know when they're going to have the flyover? Is it scheduled for Memorial Day? Yes, every every Memorial Day they do several of the aircraft, uh, uh, and, and actually Dennis Lord is one of the pilots that uh, participates every year. Mm -hmm. So, for me, I would say, could we at least reach out and maybe see if it could be slightly expanded so all of the people on the hill can see those wonderful planes fly over? Absolutely, I've already taken those steps to contact Mr. Lord because I know he's embedded with them, but I can reach out to Green Hills as well. Okay. And, and Mr. Mayor. Is this something that we could just explore and rather than agendizing it again, we could I could just reach out to the council saying um, it, it's it's feasible, it, it's not feasible. And if it is feasible, then we can report back to the council um, on what would be involved in that. Sure. I don't think you need to make it complicated. Okay. As long as my fellow council members are okay with that. Well, John, are you advocating that to work with Green Hills to have the flyover on Memorial Day weekend or the 4th of July or both? I, I was just saying for Memorial Day at this point, just to slightly expand what they already do. That way it'd be very little cost to the city potentially, if any. But Is where would they fly over? I mean, we're not having a gathering at City Hall at that point in time. Yeah, but if you were aware that those planes were going to fly over at a certain time and we advertise it, people can sit out on their backyards and watch the planes. I think that addresses the point about trying to get parking, too, because we're not advertising it to the rest of the world, really. I think piggybacking it on the Green Hills flyover uh, would be a great idea. It would reduce the cost and just expand it to cover more than Green Hills. Yeah, that's all I'm asking. I, th I think that's that's very worthwhile exploring. Dave, Eric, you guys okay? I'm okay. No, no objections to the to the inquiry. I'd okay. Be very interested in hearing the results. Yeah, I concur. I mean, I love the aviation and aerospace industry as much or more than anyone. <laughs> um, but there, I think, are some logistical challenges for doing a full blown air show out of our city, uh, both fiscally as well as um, access wise. And I think uh, your suggestion, uh, Mayor, is absolutely outstanding to join forces with uh, someone in the city and see if we can do uh, uh, two things with uh, one uh, event. Okay, Corey, you're clear? I'm clear. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Next item. Our next item. Our next item is for consideration and possible action to receive a report on potential measure W regional and local projects. Um, we do have one request to speak. They are at Hess Park at the moment. And um, okay. 
that in mind. Um, so whenever you're ready to hear that speaker, please let me know. That way I can um, send over a message. For them do we to typically do the staff report first and then have the speaker? Yes, so I'll, I'll get him ready. Okay, thank you. Ready. Yep. Why do you do this? Staff report then, or, or... Go ahead. Yeah. I'm gonna turn this to public works. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mayor and uh, council members, this uh, next item is to receive a report on a uh, potential measure W regional and local projects. Uh, we have a, a presentation that will be done by our environmental consultant, John L. Hunter and Associates. And we're asking him to uh, phone in or chime in. All right, uh, Charles, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, City Council, thank you. Um, there you are. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, well, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I've got quite a bit, quite a few uh, slides uh, to go uh, to go through. Um, could you, how, how long will that take? Oh, it, it won't take but 10 minutes. Okay, go for it. I think it's a pretty important issue. So John, please. All right, uh, yeah, so uh, our first, uh, the first item here, uh, there we go. Uh, this, uh, the, the arrow is not as important uh, and that I won't go over the dots, but each of these dots starting in 1969 are important milestones. Uh, we've basically had, we're in our fourth NPDES uh, uh, permit that regulates uh, runoff. And uh, we're gonna be getting the fifth uh, permit uh, probably uh, this, uh, later, this, uh, later this year. Uh, the uh, current uh, permit, uh, and apologies, I, it looks like I made the slide just a little bit too, uh, too large, uh, but basically the gist is uh, we've always estimated it's going to be about $20 billion throughout LA County to uh, comply with this. And since 1991, when we had the first permit, there has been no uh, source of uh, funding. Uh, realizing this back in uh, 2015, uh, LA County spearheaded a clean beach initiative, uh, which would have uh, established a parcel fee uh, to fund this. Uh, it never made it to the 2016 ballot. Um, and um, so um, the um, uh, uh, Rancho Palos Verdes has been meeting uh, with the Pen Palos Verdes Peninsula Watershed Management Group every month. Uh, that is basically the cities of uh, Palos Verdes uh, Estates, Rolling Hills Estates, uh, Rolling Hills, and also LA County and LA County Flood Control and uh, attempting to uh, comply with, uh, with this effort. And it has been very tough on a, on a shoestring budget. Uh, so in 2018, California was suffering through its seventh uh, consecutive year of drought. Uh, and the county was able to put the measure W on the ballot. And basically that was uh, to capture and treat stormwater runoff, uh, which would uh, improve stormwater quality. Uh, the measure was approved by 69.45% of the, uh, the voters. Uh, and now that it is in place, we're calling it the Safe Clean Water Program. So that's a little bit of uh, background on how we got to where we are today. So starting in October uh, 2019, and uh, for all the uh, homeowners and property owners, you probably noticed uh, in October, uh, there was a new fee on your property tax bill. Uh, the fee is very complicated on how it was determined. Uh, they basically flew over the area with airplanes and using uh, LIDAR, which is li light radar and aerial photography. And they figured out just how much impermeable surface, you know, roofs, driveways, you have on each of the properties. And then they charged uh, two and a half cents per square foot of impermeable area every year. Uh, in general, the fee is about $65 to $90 a year for an average uh, single family uh, home. Uh, for a small business, it's probably in the two to $300 uh, range every, uh, every year. Uh, and just as, as a, a note, uh, property owners can estimate their uh, fee or can see what their fee is at safecleanwater.org uh, slash calculator. So if you have any questions on this, you can go there. Um, 
And so uh, schools and municipal properties are exempt. And just as a note, um, we learned this the hard way the other day, not at Rancho Palos Verdes, but in another city that I worked for. Uh, that is municipal properties within the city. So if the city owns any municipal properties outside the jurisdiction, water wells, something like that, uh, which, which RPV wouldn't, but something some cities do, uh, those are not exempt. Uh, Low-income seniors can file for exemptions. Um, parcels that have uh, already have stormwater treatment systems. For example, for many years now, we've been requiring new development to put in filters, uh, permeable pavement, bioswales, rain gardens. You can file for a partial uh, credit. Uh, the problem is uh, that it has to be recertified by a, a California registered civil engineer annually. And to be perfectly honest uh, with you, uh, it will be cheaper for a property owner just to pay the fee than it will be to be exempted. But the option for exemption or partial exemption it exists. Uh, in case the city gets any requests for exemptions, uh, this is not the city's responsibility. That is the responsibility of LA County and they should just be referred to, uh, to them. Uh, countywide, the measure is, is anticipated to generate uh, between 265 and 285 million annually. Uh, about 50% of that is going to go into large scale regional projects. And that's about $18 million a year will go into the South of Santa Monica Bay watershed, which I, I've got a slide in a moment. And that is for your big projects. About 40% of this, and in Rancho Palos Verdes case, that's going to be about $690,000 a year, will be returned to the city for uh, use in municipal water quality, supply projects, and uh, program implementation. And then 10% is reserved for LA County flood control administration. Um, the draft fund transfer agreement, uh, the cities are going to have to sign an agreement with flood control to get that, that, that money. That was released on March 9th and uh, comments are due April 7th. Uh, we're still going over that, but that is going to be an important item. That's going to be the, the way you get the, uh, the funds. And just as a note before I leave this slide, uh, it is very vague on what constitutes uh, as I said in the second bullet, municipal water quality slash supply projects. So, and the county is perfect, purposely vague on that. We've asked for some clarification, but right now it's it's very, very broad as, as what would qualify to be used for that. Uh, for the $18 million, this is the area that it uh, will be spent in. So anywhere from the San Pedro area, stretching all the way up to uh, Inglewood, uh, north of us, and you can see the Rancho Palos Verdes is, is clearly within, uh, within that, uh, that area. Um, this is a complicated slide, so I'm just going to, uh, to go over it very, very briefly, but I, I wanted to put it in uh, for the, uh, the uh, record. Uh, there are basically, uh, for the regional projects, that's the $18 million, you have infrastructure programs, uh, which is gonna be 85% of the budget. That's the big regional projects. Technical resources, uh, which is, well, let's see if a project was actually feasible before we get to that 18 million. And then scientific studies, which is 5% of the, uh, the budget. And that technical resource program is important because I'm going to be talking about that in just a moment. And that's 10% of that $18 million. And uh, very important, eligible projects must have a strong water supply and a water quality element. So those two are, are critical for, for projects to uh, qualify. Uh, these projects are reviewed, and I, in the interest of time, I won't go over this but there are in detail, but there are three committees that have to approve uh, these projects, a steering committee, a storing, scoring committee, and an oversight committee. And when all those agree, the projects uh, get referred to the Board of Supervisors, and the Board of Supervisors is the group that actually formally awards the, uh, the money. So uh, the takeaways on this, uh, and this is not my final slide, I've got uh, a few others to go, but the takeaways on this, the regionally, uh, this area will get $18 million for big projects. The city of Rancho Palos Verdes will get uh, $690,000, and that varies from year to year depending on uh, the amount of, of, of revenue that is, is collected. And uh, so uh, we would expect the, uh, transfer agreements to be signed sometime in July and August and with the funds hopefully uh, shortly after that. 
Uh, there is no sunset clause on this. So this is going to continue in perpetuity. Now, uh, along that, uh, the, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes has got, uh, basically it's two projects that we're interested in. Uh, Eastview Park Project. We have actually approached the steering committee and asked them uh, if they would be interested in allocating uh, $300,000, and that would be from the regional, the $18 million pot, uh, and that would be paid to LA County to develop a technical um, uh, feasibility study for Eastview Park to see what we could do for, for, for Eastview Park. And um, basically, uh, what we're looking to see is, unfortunately, the, the slide is covers where Eastview Park is, but it's on the far uh, e eastern part of the uh, of the uh, the city, and and basically we're going to see. Well, can we collect water there? Can we treat water there? And um, uh, is it feasible? Are there any problems there? Uh, there's geotechnical constraints that we have to to. Uh, look at is it the landslide area liquefaction uh, zone oh there there's eastview park so we're looking at that and just to see that we're uh, in, in addition to eastview park uh, we're also exploring we're supporting torrance's air uh, effort to have a, uh, a a treatment system at the torrance airport which would alleviate some of the pollution that comes from the peninsula to machado lake uh, there's uh, we're also supporting the county's effort at harbor city park that does the same and also, uh, we're looking into Portuguese Bend landslide mitigation. So uh, we're actively looking at projects in those uh, in those areas. So um, I, I won't spend too much time on uh, this slide. I already basically talked about what uh, what we're doing uh, on that. But we are uh, looking for funding for those projects. Uh, Eastview Park. Uh, it's a, a flat. Uh, it's it's a flat area. It has a drainage area of about 350 acres, so it's pretty uh, pretty good size. Uh, it's got good storm drain air access. The storm drain that we want to accept, uh, intercept runs right under that uh, that uh, project, and it's going to help us with compliance with uh, what is, is flows into LA Harbor. Um, basically, we, uh, as I said before, we have made this uh, presentation to the uh, uh, you see the WAS there, the Watershed Area Steering Committee. Uh, we made that last month, and we're requesting three hundred thousand uh, dollars. That goes to the county. County will be the lead on this, but they will need approval of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes because it's it's basically it is the city's park, and I have to qualify that it is the city it has the surface rights, but the, the land itself is actually owned by the sanitation district. And here is the Eastview Park. The purple lines you can see uh, the line coming in from the. Uh, Left-hand side that drains a large that drains 350. It drains right through the park. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better location with a, a storm drain going right through the park. Uh, the challenges: uh, it is owned, actually owned by the sanitation district. Uh, you see those two red lines there. Uh, very interesting. Those are the outfall lines from the county sanitation district. They're buried 200 feet below ground. And we want that feasibility study to tell us whether or not we can actually build something there. The sanitation district, uh, <coughs> no. So we have to uh, we have to look into uh, into that. Um, so uh, th those those outfalls are being uh, uh, I, I don't want to say abandoned, but they are uh, being replaced by a newer unit about a, a thousand uh, feet, I believe it was, to the east. But uh, they are going to the sanitation is, district is going to keep these as uh, potential backup. So uh, this is what our plan would be. Uh, in blue would be that line that we would capture. We would pretreat the water. We would capture it. We could use the water to irrigate the uh, the uh, uh, park and send any uh, treat, treated water back into the storm drain. Or preferably, we could send it uh, to the sanitation district uh, to use as reclaim. So. Uh, it's a complex investigation will probably take a year uh, the money will come from the uh, regional pot uh, but we are asking the city council to uh, uh, you know, uh, if they have any comments on 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 our taking that uh, that uh, uh, um, approach so uh, no commitment uh, will be required if the project si uh, site is found to be feasible or infeasible um, uh, that would be the next step if it works 
then 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 we, we have to go back and decide whether or not it uh, it's uh, uh, we want to move forward with the project. It'll improve the water quality, uh, increase water supply, improve flood control by uh, capturing some water. You'll get uh, good water to uh, irrigate the surface, native vegetation, and in increased recreational opportunities. And now I do want to make a mention that we also have, before we go to questions, we have the lands, the Portuguese Bend landslide uh, area uh, project. That does appear that it would qualify for regional funding if we want to approach that. There are some other projects that I have that are other cities have have asked for that have larger drainage areas. So uh, we can we can certainly apply for that. Uh, we uh, we might want to use some of that six hundred and ninety thousand dollars at the city match to use that. And for as far as we can tell, it certainly is eligible. Uh, we might want to. In fact, we probably will want to in order to make these funds. Uh, 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 eligible, uh, this project eligible for the funds, is capture some of that water and instead of sending it out to the ocean, we would send it into the sanitation district lines that are down there through a pump station. We could discharge it at night and the fees, the uh, use fees would be very minimal at that uh, at that point. So uh, with that, that concludes my uh, presentation and I'll be happy to leave this, uh, this, uh, this line or this screen up uh, if that is uh, while, while you take your, your the question from the public, or um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to how uh, technically how to go from this uh, this point. No, that's fine. Thank you, John, for that presentation. Um, right now, uh, council has questions. Councilman Dida. Yeah, uh, we had a feasibility uh, study made for Portuguese Bend slide. Uh, in your view, have you read it, and do you think? it would qualify as a feasibility study for the things we would do in that slide to remediate it and improve the situation. I have actually not read that slide yet. I've been briefed on the project. I think it would qualify, but I have not actually read the feasibility study, but I would actually love to read that. And any other questions? No, uh, Mr. Let's, let's get them a copy. If you'd love to read it, let's get them a copy. Of course, <laughs> Mayor Prostion. Yes, Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you for the presentation on this. Uh, just one clarification, um, you are drawing the distinction in the use of the, the funds for this measure by regional and municipal projects, and then you started to answer to the question I had at the end of your commentary about uh, the landslide potentially being uh, eligible. So I guess my question is, of the $690,000 elopement that you spoke to for our city, did I understand correctly that should the landslide qualify as a regional uh, project that that would take us beyond that 690,000? That's a different segment of the, the funds that are set aside for this measure? Uh, or is the uh, allocation true? Okay. I, I like to call it just two different pots of money. We have an $18 million pot and we have a $690,000 uh, $690, pot. So, so in other words, if we were to proceed tonight with the recommendation on the Eastview project, that doesn't preclude us from continuing our exploration around how this could potentially address some of our landslide work as well. Correct. Excellent. Thank you. John, thank you for that presentation. I, I had heard the sanitation district talk because of um, people's good water usages and using less of it that they, they are thinking about utilizing the existing um, sewer lines eventually to to pick up the the first uh, or the two year kind of first flush. Is there is there any validity to that, and is that something that will eventually help us out? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, projects throughout uh, LA County are planning on sending water to the sanitation district because actually the the captured stormwater. Uh, is, is it's actually a higher quality than the reclaimed water that they're, the sanitation district is currently providing. So the, the district, uh, you know, it, although the district wants the water, they're, they're not going to give us a discount on, on the discharge into their system. But if we discharge it in the evening, the rates are all are very negligible. Got it. Any other questions? I think we have a comment from the uh, public. Is Emily, we have a 
someone from the public? We do, and we'll get them ready. Um, before we do that, um, Hunter will need to um, stop, stop being the presenter in order for us to view, to look at the, to see the um, speaker. Okay, here it goes. No pressure. <laughs> he did it. Virginia, yes. Here. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, good evening. My name is Shariar Eftekarzadeh. Uh, I am a professional civil engineer uh, with 30 years experience, and uh, I have a PhD in hydraulics uh, with the emphasis on stormwater. Uh, so I want to chime in with the recommendation that the Portuguese Ben really is a, the Portuguese Ben project is a prime candidate for the uh, Measure W regional project. And in fact, we have taken the initiative, uh, you see, we attended the, your December 17 meeting on the uh, Portuguese Ben project that was developed by the, uh, your consultant. And uh, we provided some, uh, I provided some uh, written comments, uh, an email to everybody. And I received some uh, quite positive feedback from uh, Mayor Cruikshank and uh, uh, the city staff. And I've met since with the, with, uh, with the members of the city staff on those comments and was encouraged uh, with those uh, meetings. And we, I uh, provided uh, a couple of schemes that would help the management of this project. And just lately, we have uh, actually uh, taken the initiative and proposed a, a rescoping uh, and repurposing of the Portuguese Bend project so that uh, it would actually qualify for Measure W. And uh, we summarized those in the form of a presentation, which uh, uh, we sent to uh, uh, Councilman Daida. And uh, he has, uh, I understand that he has uh, discussed that with Mayor, with Mr. Mayor Krukshank, and uh, they see benefit and merit to it. So, so we have, you know, uh, we've just finished this, uh, a, this regional project feasibility study for a very complex project in uh, the city of Los Angeles. And that has gone through all those uh, hoops that uh, was were described to you and has uh, is being recommended for funding. In fact, it was the, one of the highest ranking projects and it's gonna receive $21 million funding. So we believe that uh, with some tweaks, we can actually uh, fill in the application in time for this July 31st deadline, which is the deadline for this next round of funding. And uh, our estimate is that you could uh, apply uh, for, 20, for uh, $11 million. And uh, we've done a preliminary scoring of your project as a BMP project. And uh, you know, it's very high score. So that, uh, with that, I, I recommend and suggest that uh, you, you capture this opportunity and, uh, uh, and we can commit to preparing the feasibility study for you in time for this uh, application. That, and that's my call. Well, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Um, any questions of the speaker? Okay, thank you very much. Can you have, get that telephone conversation off? Yeah, we hear some feedback. If someone's got a microphone, they can. Well, it's like somebody's dialed in. I'm not sure who that is. It's not identified. They're just. Uh... Charles is pointing, so he's identified something. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Good work. Um, okay, so uh, we've heard the the report from Mr. Hunter and, and from our speaker, uh, discussion. Okay, S seeing none. So basically the recommendation is to receive and file the report uh, to include those uh, potential regional and local projects and to direct staff to proceed with uh, appropriating funds for Measure W for Eastview Park and Portuguese Bend landslide remediation. Uh, and I'll make that motion if there's a I'll second. second. Any other further discussion? I just wanna be clear that the second was by Ms. Um, Council Member um, Bradley. No, no. Mayor Pro Tem. I'll agree. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. I tried, he beat me <laughs> to it. Okay. okay. And, and Mayor, 
reemphasize what we've already touched on, which is um, if this is an opportunity for us to leverage um, work that we're trying to do to remediate the landslide, um, absolutely, I think we should we should be jumping right into that and looking at that um, in the near. And I just want to clarify that in the recommendation, we're pursuing um, as as a local project the Portuguese Bend landslide remediation project and Eastview Park. Um, to proceed with a feasibility study for a regional project. So the two separate um, types of projects. Can I ask John uh, Hunter, do you, the, the speaker said that the um, Portuguese Bend could be eligible for up to 11 million. Is that, is that feasible? Uh, absolutely. And uh, he said it was, uh, it's, it passed the, uh, the, the minimum score and it doesn't matter how high it scores. As long as it passes the minimum score, you're eligible. So I, I would say absolutely, it, it, the, the uh, application uh, cost is minimal uh, and uh, the deadline is going to, is July 31st. And so, yeah, I, I would consider uh, going, uh, doing the Portuguese Bend uh, as a regional project. Uh, you will know shortly after that uh, whether uh, it is accepted or not. Uh, the, re the $18 million pot is competitive. So maybe you'll get it, maybe you won't. As, as I'd mentioned, there's a lot of other projects out there that are competing for it, but uh, it it's, does not take much effort to, to at least ask. And for the Eastview Park, uh, we're not asking for any city funding at this point. We are going to ask the uh, that the 300,000 for the uh, uh, feasibility study, come out of the $18 million pot, if that's, if that's clear. So everything at this point, we're asking for the 18 million, but um, the, um, as, a, as a fallback, the, 18, the uh, landslide area could be funded by the uh, 670,000. Okay, and before we have further discussion, so I think I want to, amend that motion to have the Portuguese Bend as a regional project as well. If that's what you were saying, Aura. Correct. I, I'd like to I would, make that. I would clarify. Yeah, I would, okay. I would suggest moving forward with exploring Portuguese Bend as both a regional or, or, and or a local project. Okay, I'd like to make that am amendment. Uh, Eric, you okay with that? Yes. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Ferraro. No, hold on, Councilwoman Ferraro. I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to um, to access some funds, hopefully, if we get approved, to improve the situation in the landslide area and uh, not have to come up with the money ourselves. So I'm all for this going after these these potential funds and because it certainly could qualify as a reclamation of water. That's the whole problem with the landslide in the first place. And if we can uh, qualify under this program, I think it's an excellent idea. Great, Councilman Dida. Yeah, uh, we have two different approaches. Uh, one by the original feasibility study and a different approach by uh, the last speaker. Is staff gonna look at both of those? from a feasibility and cost standpoint and uh, give us that information? I All think right. it would be appropriate. Yeah, yes, we. I would imagine if we're gonna move forward with um, Portuguese Ben as um, either a local or regional project, we would have to do a feasibility study. There's gonna be a price tag associated with pr uh, preparing that feasibility study. And I'll, I'll defer to Public Works if I misspoke there. Um, so what we could do is explore those, those, um, the, the what, was but what was proposed this evening, yes, those options, and then we'd come back with, with uh, a budget appropriation for that, if warranted. Oh. Okay, so both options, the original feasibility study and the last speaker's approach is going to be uh, considered, right? Yes. Good, thank you. It looks like Elias might want to say something. Do you want to add anything, Elias? Uh, no. Okay, you were leaning in a bit. I didn't know. <laughs> okay, very good. Any other comments from uh, council? So, Mr. Mayor, 
Yes. Uh, and, and for the city clerk, are, are we now clear that the motion is to direct two feasibility studies? Yes, for, oh, I lost my screen there. Yes, and to- I'd like to make, I, I'd like to make a friendly amendment that uh, uh, both feasibility studies would be part of the effort. Uh, if that, I if think that, that's a part of the motion. Yeah, that was already a part of the motion, so that's totally acceptable. Okay, so as long as both are in the motion, it's fine. Okay, can, I hate to ask, but can either Mayor Cruikshank or Mayor Pro Tem Alegria repeat the motion? Only because um, Mayor Pro Tem Alegria, his, um, the, his audio was in and out. Okay. Or would you like me to repeat what I have? Well, I'll try to just keep it simple, Emily. Thank so you. basically it's the recommended council action. The only difference is that in item two, uh -huh. where it says the Portuguese Bend landslide remediation project as a local project, we want to say as a regional project and a local project. Got it, local project and regional. And that's the only modification. And, and, we're, gonna, and, about, we're, uh, and we're going to look at both feasibility approaches. Is I don't understand what the difference is. How is the friendly um, amendment? Is there a second? I'm still trying. What What is the difference? I mean, we're we're basically saying. Okay, we have two feasibility studies. One that was provided by DBS. Okay, and then the last speaker uh, is talking about a different, uh, slightly different approach. And what I'm wondering is are both going to be considered from both a technical and cost standpoint? Uh, I can elaborate on that. Yes. Uh, what the approach would be is we work with uh, John Hunter, our consulting firm who handles these projects for us, but I'll be glad to meet with the speaker and seek any input from him as appropriate uh, and would be appropriate, but uh, our plan is to work with John Hunter who is who is our uh, consulting firm and, and is very familiar with Measure W. He has been part of the process ever since, and that would be what uh, what we, we would like to do. Well, that's a little bit different than the motion. Right. Yes. <clears throat> so as I understand the motion, members of the council, it is to direct, it is to receive and file a report and then amending that to add to do a study of two locations as both two approaches two approaches as both a local and a regional app, uh, application for lack of a better word project yeah. I, I thought there were two different yeah can i can i study two different areas yeah there are there are two projects right one is east view project and we would like to get the city council blessing to apply for East View project as a regional project, that's one, and do the feasibility study. The second project is Portuguese band landslide project, which we would still be working with John Hunter, and we would investigate both possibilities of applying for for the for the Portuguese band landslide project, both from local point of view as well as regional point of view. Yeah, I think that's my understanding of the motion. That, that's what the current motion is. I don't know if we want to tell the staff the means and methods in which they, uh, who they hire or, you know, get information from at this point. If, if that's not part of the motion. So, so in other words, if they want to uh, right. inquire with the speaker, whoever they want, right, right. I mean, it, Elias can meet with the public speaker and, and get his input. He feels if his expertise is needed, then he can let Ara know, and they can figure out how to engage him. I'm still uh, Emily. So, um, so here's the motion as I understand it: receive and file a report, direct mm -hmm. the city do a feasibility study for what's the first project? East <laughs> East View Park as either a local or a regional project, and and Portuguese Bend as either a local or regional project. Staff to use its best discretion 
as to uh, the means and methods of accomplishing that? No, not exactly. With all due respect, the Eastview Park project would not have any local implication. It'll be a regional project. So my concern about that is if staff wants us to pursue Eastview as a regional project, would that preclude the second element of the motion, and that is to study whether or not it would be appropriate to apply for the Portuguese Bend as a regional project. May and I suggest we, we bifurcate this so that we treat each system separately because it's being so commingled, it's getting confusing. Why don't we just deal with one motion for Eastview, put that aside, because that seems to be very simple, and then go to the uh, Portuguese Ben slide to clarify that one. Okay, but I, I like where the city attorney's question was going. If can we apply for two projects as regional projects, and do does that interfere with one or the other? Right. And the answer is, and John, please weigh on this. I believe we could. Yeah, there will there will be no problem. Okay. Okay. So then, I don't think we need to bifurcate the motion. The okay. motion is we receive and file, we direct that both projects be studied, analyzed, an application for certain to be submitted with respect to the Eastview project as a regional project and an analysis of Portuguese Bend as to whether or not it would qualify for regional funding or local funding and an action to make an appropriate application for that. That sounds good to me. And I'm still in support of the motion. Okay, Ken, Ken are you okay with this? I, uh, just to memorialize it, I would like to see that we take advantage of anything that would be in the speaker's program so that we look at both from a feasibility, technical, and cost standpoint and make that decision on that basis. I'd just like to have that memorialized in the motion. Okay, but we don't really I, have I a think proposal. it's there. I think it's there. Yeah, I, I would agree. It's inherently built into the motion. I think based on what we heard from the council, we will, in, in exploring the feasibility of Portuguese Bend landslide as either a regional or local project, we'll factor in um, any public comments as, as part of our overall um, consideration to submit. All right, so Madam City Clerk, okay. do you understand the motion? The motion will be recorded as you stated. Okay, great. Bill? Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, any further comment, questions? Um, Mr. Mayor, Yes. our public speaker would like to speak again if possible. Uh, if there's no objection from our council? No objection. All right, no. tell him he can speak for a minute or two. Give us a second. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity again. I would just like to reiterate that uh, the feasibility study for a regional project is quite a complex matter. And your existing consultant have done and looked at what uh, you know, is possible in terms of stormwater and they've produced what they have produced. And if you are to catch this opportunity for this, uh, this time, this round of funding, which uh, uh, the deadline for which is 31st of July, uh, you, uh, there is really no time, you know, to uh, be, you know, starting from, from, from scratch. And what we have demonstrated and have uh, shared with you is that there is this opportunity to actually do that. And we commit to that because of the expertise we have. So that's the public consultation. Yeah, but Mr. Mayor, two, two responses to that. Number one, Given the recent declarations of emergency, I'd be willing to bet large amounts of money that all these time deadlines are gonna be extended. That's point number one. And point number two is we don't contract with vendors through oral communications. Agreed. Anyhow, we appreciate people coming and giving us good ideas. And so we appreciate you coming tonight and, and telling us that. Um, and we'll let the staff do what they do in terms of procuring um, what we need to, to move these forward. Uh, any other comments from the council? Uh, no, let's take a vote. 
All right, okay. roll call. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Council Member Dida? Yes. Council Member Ferraro? Yes. Council Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cruikshank? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Next item. Our next item. Our next item for consideration and possible action to receive an update presentation on the city's Southford <laughs> pension costs and benefit changes. Late correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting. There are no requests to speak at this time. Okay, is there a, a staff report or at least a light one? Yeah. <laughs> is and, it Angie? Yeah, there yes. she is. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Uh, in September of last year, the staff gave the Finance Advisory Committee on an update on the city's CalPERS plan. Tonight, we're going to share this update with you and provide you with uh, an overview of the pension funding options, including the development of a pension policy for uh, council consideration. Next slide, Nathan. Thank you. So the 63 members currently employed by the city fall into one of three tiers. Uh, as you can see here, tier one has a formula of two and a half to 55. Employees contribute 8% of their annual uh, pension, uh, or their annual salaries, excuse me. And this group is anyone that's hired on or before uh, September 20th, 2011. Tier two are those that are hired after September 20th, 2011, but have prior uh, years of service with PERS or another agency. Formula is 2% at 60 with an employee contribution of 7%. And tier three are PEPRA members that um, are that were hired by the city on or after January 1st, 2013. Have a formula very similar to uh, Social Security, 2% at 62, and they contribute six and a quarter percent of their annual salary. Next slide. So here we have uh, the um, just a slide, a very brief slide on what makes up our annual the city's annual payment towards uh, CalPERS. So part of that is the normal cost, what is referred to as a normal cost, and it pays for a year's worth of benefit accruals for each employee based on the three tiers that oh, that they fall under. The second is basically a catch-up payment and includes any losses incurred during the year, such as investment earnings, member adjustments, and is also the biggest cause for our continuous increases. Next slide, please. Now here you have the CalPERS pension buck and it this displays um, how uh, current retirees are paid. Uh, CalPERS uh, relies on investment earnings to make up the bulk of the uh, uh, retiree uh, payments, but as the investment earnings fall short, then uh, CalPERS um, has to make it up with higher uh, uh, employer contributions. Next slide. So here we have just the funded status as of our last valuation. As you can see, uh, for the three plans, we have an estimated unfunded liability of about $12.3 uh, million. And uh, the chart below shows the just how the accrued liability has changed over the same five years, and um, also what the unfunded accrued liability has increased to over the last five years. So you can see that it's almost doubled, and that is partly because of the lesser performing investment earnings by CalPERS. Um, next slide. So here you have the makeup of uh, the member tiers and the employees in each tier. Um, as you can see, over the last five years, uh, tier one, the most expensive tier, has um, the employees in that group have been cut in half, and that is through regular attrition. So as employees retire, we are um, replacing them with uh, PEPRA employees. And what's good about that is that we have a longer period of time to fund the future contributions. Uh, but because the employees in tier one uh, have retired at such a fast speed, it also um, has a, an opposite effect on our funded status. So as you can see, five years ago uh, or six years ago, we were funded at almost 80%. 
And as of the latest valuation, it went down to um, less than 72% for that tier one combined almost 73%. Next slide, please. And so here, this slide is a little busy, but um, it breaks down uh, the, each of the tiers. And as you can see, tier one makes up roughly 98% of our total unfunded accrued liability. And, um, you know, it's, it's doubled over the last five years and uh, the accrued liability has grown of, of about $10 million in those five years. And uh, the other two tiers, because the new entrants into those plans um, have essentially a fresh start, those, um, those two tiers are funded at over 90%, which is, you know, uh, considered uh, not fully funded, but adequately funded. Next slide. So despite the fact that CalPERS has had a lesser performing investment earnings, um, when we compare ourselves to other cities um, of our size or our um, makeup, um, you know, member cities that are also bedroom communities that are somewhat uh, close to 100% contract um, cities, we're falling within their same range. Um, we are funded 73% uh, compared to other cities that are also in the 70, 70 to 79% 70, uh, range. Next slide. So the purpose of us bringing forward this staff report and um, status is to uh, start conversations about the potential of funding of putting together a pension policy. First for vetting through the Finance Advisory Committee and um, subsequently to bring to council for consideration. Now we wanna design a pension uh, funding policy to preserve financial flexibility and give us the best um, uh, investment returns uh, better than what CalPERS is currently performing at. Be consistent with best practices and Government Finance uh, Officers Association or GFOA. Uh, hopefully have shorter amortization periods and be able to pay off the unfunded liability in less than 20 years. And also have a better uh, annual contribution that uh, 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 diminishes the possibility of owing any additional interest on the unfunded extra liability. Next slide. So included in the potential potential pension policy are funding considerations. Now, as you can read from the staff report, out of the three, um, we recommend section 115, but for full transparency, we also wanted to show other uh, ways to pay down the UAL. The first being a pension obligation bond. So these are bonds that do not have to be um, uh, through a voter uh, measure but that pay off that unfunded actuarial liability by um, paying them off with the bond proceeds. Now, this is not a recommended strategy uh, uh, by the GFOA be simply because you're paying uh, off a fluid liability with a very fixed amount. So as that unfunded liability changes, you no longer consider, you're no longer considered as paying off that liability. It just grew and now you're locked into a debt instrument. Uh, the second um, option would be to pay down the city's unfunded actuarial liability by just contributing more to CalPERS. So again, because we've just shown that CalPERS has underperformed with investment earnings, that would not be something that would be advisable. The last item would be a section 115 trust. And so this is an irrevocable trust that provides the city with a far more flexible um, alternative um, to funding or uh, making additional contributions to the pension. And that is because it allows for uh, a better option in terms of investment uh, option mix, an investment mix. So you can actually uh, be have a little bit more uh, freedom in your investments than you would in CalPERS, which CalPERS takes total control of what investment mix there will be. And your uh, traditional um, portfolio, investment portfolio with the city that we have to, where we have to abide by a certain government um, code. Next slide. 
So just to dig a little bit deeper into the Section 115 trust, again, it is an irrevocable trust and can be used by local governments to fund essential government functions and providing for pension obligations um, is, is um, within the essential government functions. Any income derived from a Section 115 trust is tax exempt. And um, once the contributions are placed into this trust, assets from the trust can be used for retirement plan purposes. So we set aside through you know, council action a certain amount, let's say a part of the annual surplus to put into that trust. That trust then earns um, interest earnings higher than the stated 1.8% that we're currently earning on our treasury portfolio. Uh, if those, um, we let those uh, ride for a few years and um, what we earn in that or what we have in that Section 115 trust, we can use at a later date to fund that ongoing pension obligation, be it the normal cost that was described earlier or that amortized um, annual unfunded actuarial liability component. Um, so uh, the risk is very low. Um, there's almost no risk because we can pull from those from that uh, trust at any time. We we don't have to fund it at all. There's no requirement for an annual contribution. It's at the city's discretion, and um, we can have a zero balance in it and have no um, you know no no charges, no interest fees, no no penalties, no anything. Next slide. So here's a, a simple a sample of um, one um, uh, uh, cycle of this, how to form a Section 115 trust. Um, we target a discount rate, a risk tolerance, investment philosophy. All the items listed in phase one would be included in the pension uh, policy as will uh, the portfolio, the model portfolio. So we decide on an investment strategy that is from conservative all the way to risky. And obviously we would never advise for a risky um, investment uh, strategy. And we also define a portfolio manager. We select from one of many um, investment managers such as PFM, or uh, PARS, just as an example of a few of those uh, portfolio managers that provide this service. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a just a, a brief overview of what we are um, recommending and we're going to be reviewing with the Finance Advisory Committee uh, the next time we, re we meet with them. Thank you, Angie. Did, mm -hmm. did you say that we would be able to pay down in 20 years? Is that what you said? Right. So CalPERS, um, in their valuation reports, they they basically provide us a 20-year pay down plan. And so our unfunded actuarial liability and the annual contribution is basically calculated so that we can pay it down in 20 years. Okay. And in, in terms of this trust, are, are you going to be making recommendations on how much we put in that trust or is that part of the finance committee's discussions? Well, the, we would we would essentially um, recommend parameters such as a portion of the surplus um, or a certain dollar amount at, you know, as we vetted through the finance advisory committee, but then uh, uh, subsequently bring it to city council Got or it. city council's uh, decision. Question. Questions? Um, yeah, Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor, I'll make a few comments. Um, thank you for the presentation, Angie. Uh, it's certainly encouraging to see, and I want to commend prior councils to, uh, because of the tiering. Um, you can see the dramatic swing that we've experienced over mm -hmm. the last five years. So we are seeing, even though the costs are going up, they would be exponentially higher if we hadn't had this tier uh, tiered approach. And so there's certainly uh, progress on that front. I agree with your comment about whatever strategy we choose or policy we develop and, uh, and approve. Uh, financial flexibility in that policy should be really the, the focus and the goal. And I think you answered this already, but I was going to ask about how this uh, Section 115 trust sort of compares to other investment options. The only thing I'm, I'm concerned about is 
once you put funds in, you're limited to the the use of those funds for a singular purpose. Um, was I right in understanding that that would be the case if we were to, to, to take this approach? Yes, they would be uh, restricted to funding your ongoing pension obligation. But being that our uh, annual contributions paid to CalPERS is already 1.2 million and above, we could mm -hmm. use that Section 115 trust at any point to pay down that annual amount and future amounts. So potentially the FAC and your, with your guidance um, and input could come up with it, an approach to come up with that annual amount plus a little bit of a surplus mm -hmm. to, to stay maybe conservative, for example. Okay. Yes, we could. Um, Okay. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. With that, I mean, I'm I'm certainly very interested in hearing what the uh, facts input is, and um, I know you already talked about you know paying it down and some other approaches that that I just don't see a lot of uh, validity in because of the fact that it's such a moving target for us. Um, I think you commented on that during your report, but I do I am interested in, in seeing what kind of pension um, policy we could establish that could incorporate. Uh, the uh, Section 115 trust approach. So thank you for your pre presentation. I look forward to uh, seeing the policy come back to us. Thank you. Councilman Dida, did you have a comment? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, anyway, thank you for the work and I'm glad to see you looking at paying it down because I think at some point in time, we need to pay that down so we don't have an unfunded liability. Yeah. And what the FAC is doing uh, have they looked at this uh, uh, historical performance of the 115 and done some risk analysis between the three pro approaches so we know whether the risks are comparable or different? Yes, that is something that we are going to look at with the fact. Um, unfortunately, the meeting that we had scheduled last week had to be rescheduled, um, and that is where we were going to uh, provide them with that uh, initial set of data. Great, good. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see that because that will help. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Anyone else? Okay, is there a motion? Move staff second. recommendation. Second. Okay, motion and second. Uh, roll call. Council Member Dida? Yes. Council Member Ferraro? Yes. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cruikshank? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We can then move to the next mm. item. Is everyone doing okay? Okay, oh, next, item. next item, please. The next item is for consideration and possible action to receive a report on the Hatano Farms lease agreement at Upper Point Resented. We have no request to speak on this item. Okay, very good. And if we could have a fairly brief staff report. Certainly, Mayor Crookshank and members of the city council. Um, so the slide before you is the, uh, it's just an aerial photo of the farm at Upper Point Vicente. The inset in the lower right is a, a zoomed out slightly to show the context of the farm location versus the, uh, the other improvements at the Civic Center site. Um, the lightly green, light green shaded areas are the property that is within the, uh, the nature preserve. So uh, James Tatano had historically farmed portions of Upper Point Vicente for many years. Uh, there were a number of formal and informal agreements with both the city and the U.S. Army. Uh, entered most recently in 2006 into a lease agreement with Mr. Tatano that expired in 2011. Um, in 2012, he, he contacted the city uh, with interest in uh, retiring and transferring, reassigning the lease to his foreman. Uh, the council considered this request in December of 2012, and there were three significant policy issues that were raised as part of that review. One was consistency with the program of utilization. The second was consistency with the general plan and the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. And the third was the general form and content of the lease agreement. The POU consistency turned out to be the most intractable issue because the National Park Service had insisted and still does that agriculture is not a public park or recreation use and is not allowed on lands conveyed to the federal lands to park 
uh, program, which is how the city acquired the property. We spent about 18 months exploring options to, to undergo a conversion process to allow the farm to remain. But by 2014, had determined that that conversion process was financially infeasible. And so the council at that time elected to simply allow Mr. Hitano to continue operating the farm under the terms of the expired lease agreement. Uh, Mr. Hitano sadly passed away in 2015, and Mr. Martinez has taken over the operation of the farm and has continued to pay the annual rent of $100, which is current through March 31st of this year. Mr. Martinez grows cut flowers, vegetables, and fruit, and he has large stands of Apuntia cactus, which are grown for both their flesh and their fruit. Uh, as discussed in tonight's staff report, the agriculture uses at Upper Point Vicente are consistent with the general plan. And with respect to the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve, the property, as I mentioned, is located within the Nature Preserve and the Alta Vicente uh, Preserve in particular, and is also consistent with the NCCP and the Public Use Master Plan or PUMP. In previous discussions, uh, the NPS had mentioned that a concession agreement rather than a lease might be a, an, a way to allow uh, a third party to utilize a portion of the property. Under such an agreement, the use would have to be under the city's control, but with the concessionaire handling day-to-day -day operations. But the appropriateness of whatever agricultural use might be proposed would still be subject to NPS review. And there have been thoughts of uh, ideas such as a community garden, a native plant nursery for the land conservancy, or perhaps some type of a kitchen garden serving the Terranea Resort. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, I believe the city receives $100 a year in rent from the farm, which is far below market. Um, this was justified in furtherance of the fact that Mr. Matano was a long-standing tenant of the property and there was historic value in maintaining the tradition of the Japanese American truck farm on the peninsula. Uh, in 2012, we had estimated that the annual market rent for this property should have been around twelve dollars to $20,000 a year. As I mentioned, Hitano Farm is the last vestige of the American, uh, Japanese American truck farms that once dominated the peninsula. With Mr. Hitano's passing and Mr. Martinez taking over the operations, there is no longer any direct connection to the Hitano family uh, with the operation of this farm or this historic land use practice. If the lease is terminated, staff believes it would be appropriate for the city to somehow commemorate the Hitano family's history on this site. Um, either par party may terminate the lease at any time with 30 days notice, and Mr. Martinez will be obligated to remove all equipment and personal property from the site. So this evening, staff was seeking direction about the possible future use of the farm, including whether and or when the lease might be terminated. Uh, there may be similar non-commercial agricultural uses that the city might propose for the property, but these would require NPS approval. Uh, the terms and conditions of a future lease would need to be determined, including compensation. And staff, as I mentioned, also recommends commemorating the Hitano family and their, and their legacy on the, on the peninsula uh, on the farm site in some way uh, if the farm is eventually removed or replaced. And that concludes staff's presentation. All right, thank you, Kit. Any questions? Seeing none, there was no public comments, correct? Correct. Okay, discussion. Yeah, Councilman Dida. One question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Dida, sorry. Yes, uh, since the tunnel is no longer a part of it, and we've got all the conflicts with the uh, federal government and the slide, uh, plus the fact that uh, at $100 a year, that's, uh, <laughs> that's almost ludicrous. Um, I do think we should commemorate the fact that there is there was dry farming on a peninsula. And if memory serves me correctly, I believe the docents were going to have on the port, uh, uh, the Point Vincenti site and the Interpretive Center site uh, some demonstration of dry farming. So that would at least give the educational portion and still honor Hatano and the original owners as well, the Ishibashis. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm just curious, Kid, did, uh, what, what other uses would uh, would staff you know potentially foresee in this particular space? Well, I mean, because it's still within the portion of the Upper Point Vicente that's under the NPS land use restrictions, the the uses that are allowed there are restricted to passive recreational use. So, 
anything that gets proposed has to somehow be consistent with passive recreational use if it's going to get approval from the National Park Service. So okay. um, again, I think I mentioned there had been some thought about possibly having some type of a community garden that might um, serve the public and, and other users, um, or some type of, as, as uh, Councilman Dida mentioned, some type of a demonstration garden perhaps that would have been a historical um, feature that would show the, the history of, say, the Japanese American truck farm or the dry farming. Um, those might be acceptable to NPS, but we still need to get their approval. And and I, I'd like to okay. add, I mean, there's an opportunity, yeah. there's about five and a half acres there that perhaps the city can explore using it as um, a nursery to grow some native plants for some of our revegetation work that we may want to take on in place of the fuel modification areas. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Ara. I, so I would just say, uh, I guess, two comments. Um, I agree with uh, what's been said so far. Um, certainly out of respect for the history, I'd want to give at least adequate notice. I know 30 days is all that's required in the lease, but you know, certainly out of respect, we'd want to give a little bit more notice than that. But I would certainly be interested personally in seeing this come back to us with staff evaluation of potential uses for council's consideration in the future. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councilwoman Ferraro. Is the reason this has all come up is because farming does not go along with the NPS, uh, the Park Service's uh, guidelines? It's not that it doesn't go, uh, it's not consistent with the NPS guidelines. I think it's it's what the NPS has a concern with is the fact that we have a lease agreement. And so it's that component that there's an issue with. Um, it, agricultural uses are permitted on this portion of the property that's part of the NCCP um, preserve area. So that that is acceptable. It's the lease component. And the reason why we brought this item on the agenda is the lease is uh, is set to expire at the end of the month and there's there's potential opportunities here for the city to reclaim that land and use it for its purposes um, as perhaps a nursery or or go into some sort of partnership with um, as a concession agreement with maybe the Terranea has expressed an interest in the property or some other um, a nonprofit or organization in the on the peninsula that could use this for a community garden. So the city is trying to get rid of the farming. It, it's it's not we we you know a couple things here is you've 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 got a use there that isn't consistent with the POU in terms of there's a lease. It's not inherently. Um, consistent with what the original intent was and what was allowed to remain here. The person is paying uh, $100 a year um, for five and a half acres. There, there's a concern with that as well. And, and there are opportunities for the city to, to not only honor the history of it, but use it um, as an area for, for our benefit and the public's benefit. So we're just going to take it from them because we don't have to renegotiate on the lease. I think at this point, what 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 I'd like to see is perhaps we just put them on notice that the you know the city's exploring um, some of these opportunities and that we may not be extending this lease uh, and over the next several months. I mean, it's not something we want to you know, terminate in 30, in 30 days and say, you need to leave. I, I don't, logistically, I don't think it, all things considered, we, we don't even have the resources to do that. It's just, we want to be able to start exploring, you know, as we're, we're taking on all this fuel modification and you see that price tag with, with the costs we're incurring, and that could be an annual cost. Well, the way we can address that annual cost of all those fuel modification zones is perhaps replanting those areas um, with with vegetation that's acceptable to the fire department that doesn't need all that um, um, attention every year. And where would we grow that? We could possibly do that in this location. I see. So uh -huh. this is going to come back to us. Is that right? Well, depending on what we decide on. 
So yeah, council member Bradley. So I have a slightly uh, different view in, in that this is the last family farm in the local area. In my time on the peninsula, I've seen local farming go within our communities uh, from several folks that were making a living at it down to this is the last one. And yes, the original or the, the I guess the person that inherited it, uh, Mr. Hito um, has passed on, but this is a continuing uh, use that has been consistent over the years. I would like to see this continue to operate in continuum as is in a um, nod to the history of uh, the peninsula and the local community for local farming. I think that um, you know raising the rent to a or the lease to quote unquote market rates um, would have the intended or unintended consequence of driving them out of business. I don't think that the margins are thick enough to be able to afford a um, you know several order of magnitude increase to the lease rate. Um, I'd like to see this continuing as a operating uh, entity and operating farm. If it continues to operate continuously, I think we leave uh, the status quo alone. If it does change and somebody wants to do a different usage for it, at that point we would reevaluate the land use. I'm in agreement there. You're, you're with Dave on that one? Yes. Okay, I'm going to give you a different take. I I, I hear what you're saying there, uh, Councilman Bradley. Uh, for me, um, wow, the $100 a, a year feels like a, a unfair gift of public funds. And so I kind of have a, I have a problem with that. Um, I... I get the part about it being the last vestige of a, a truck farm, but in the same sense, it seems like they're not even willing to offer any additional money. They wanted a hundred, ha, have they even said they would pay any more or is there just want us to basically give the land up every year? We have not had any conversations about increasing the rents, but with the, yeah, we, we never had the conversation because the discussion back in 2014 was that the, we weren't going to enter into a new lease agreement because we couldn't under the NPS restrictions. No, I get it, but he, he, they're actually running a private entity, correct? Yes. So they're they're a for-profit business using city land for $100 a year, and they're using five and a half acres. And that we're, we're not giving that deal to anyone else in the city. I don't know. I, I, I have a problem with that, and I, I would look to start to either ask for more rent or revoke it. I don't believe anybody has been operating a community farm continuously for the last 50 years other um, within the city either. So I think there's precedent for it. Um, and it's a nod to the heritage. Yes, it's uh, not the <clears throat> most physical um, conservative way to use. And yes, we could probably uh, redo it and we could probably um, have a different land use for it and potentially make additional funds, but it would be in effect driving out the last of the family farms in the South Bay from um, out of business. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, so, no, I, I appreciate the sensitivity to the farming history. Actually, my family is the family of farmers. Both my brothers run an apple warehouse in Washington State. Uh, and I grew up in an orchard. So if anyone appreciates uh, the, you know, the history uh, that, that the councilman Bradley speaking to, I certainly do. H however, with that said, I tend to agree with the mayor and I tend to uh, appreciate the city manager's thinking as it relates to using a space, for instance, for, uh, uh, for, for potentially to have um, some foliage or some things that we could grow there or that we could use in other areas as part of our overall fuel modification plan. As we all know, we've invested an unexpected million point two dollars and one point two million dollars rather in uh, fuel modification <laughs> this year. Although that may not be the annual number, you know, I, I do think that there's 
Um, if we have to look at trade-offs, I think there's a potentially a better use that has a bigger, broader um, social and community benefit by using the land differently. So, so I tend to agree with the mayor and, and would certainly uh, support giving the direction to staff to look at uh, uh, other approaches and other uses. I don't think there's a big rush to terminate the lease at this moment because we don't have a plan for it yet. So I do think we could give you know general verbal notice and begin the planning and then uh, continue to communicate with the current uh, the current tenant and let them know as we get closer to a decision. Councilwoman uh, Ferraro, did you have an additional comment? Yes, I wanted to ask Ara, what what about possibly asking them if they could grow some of these plants that we need, uh, sort of a co-op project, you know, they could continue using it for the crops that they have now, but also include something that the city can use. I mean, is that a possibility? We can explore that with them. That's thinking outside of the box. That's nice. Uh, Council Member Bradley. So um, it, just a note, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, that um, lost my train of thought, um, that I would feel better if we had exhausted all of the other uh, city property um, and we had no room to grow any native uh, habitation. But I do believe that there is still significant unused city property that we haven't explored for doing that. Um, so I don't see the need to transfer land usage to this area uh, to grow native plants. I think we have other property that we could um, leverage prior to doing something like this. Okay, Councilman, uh, how about this, Mr. Councilman Dida? Yeah, I have one question. How long is it gonna be before uh, we are forced to comply with the NCCP? Well, the, the agriculture use is consistent with the NCCP. So that um, that's not the issue here. The issue is with the National Park Service and the POU, um, if, if they decide to issue us um, a follow-up notice to take action, then then we would definitely have to re react to that and and come back to the council. But at this time, they, they since 2014, we haven't heard from the National Park Service in this regard. But if but if they do, uh, we will not be in a position to take some of the options we've been talking about in the interim. Uh, so if we wait till they do, we're going to have a problem because there'll be only one way out. Uh, now, if we explore some of the ideas that council has talked about, uh, you know, lease farming or, you know, whatever, uh, uh, we might have an opportunity to do something worthwhile. But the one thing I do say, whether it's there or somewhere, we do need to recognize, just like we recognize the Tonga, Indians and everybody else, we need to recognize the dry farming done by the Japanese who did that on a peninsula. Yeah, I don't think anyone's in disagreement with that. Um, I, I like where Councilwoman Ferraro is going, that if it became more of a community benefit, um, maybe there's a way that that could be discussed. I don't know if the footprint needs to stay exactly how it is. Maybe that could be reduced down to what's needed versus what was there 50 years ago. Um, I don't know, I, and, and I agree there's probably no immediate hurry and maybe we could explore more humane options in terms of how to proceed. Yeah. Well, how about this, Mr. Mayor, based on Councilman Bradley's uh, feedback, which I appreciate, we just simply give the feedback to, that we receive in file uh, and we just give simply the feedback that we're interested in looking at alternative uses and for uh, staff to come back in the future. Uh, I'll go ahead and make that motion to receive and file and provide the general staff work. And we can, we can essentially take no action on the lease agreement other than having a conversation with, with the tenant um, until we uh, have them come back to us. In the future. I could uh, support that with the caveat that 
we extend the lease beyond the end of the month just for legal purposes. You okay on that, Eric? Yeah. I'm well, saying, I, I think uh, there, there are legal problems with that. I don't think we can do that. In fact, while, while the staff hasn't asked me to look at the issues carefully, just reading the staff report and listening uh, to the presentation from staff tonight and the questions, I actually think these folks are almost tenants at sufferance. They may be illegal tenants. We're collecting rent from them every 30 days. So an argument can be made they're month to month tenants. But if the concern that was developed back in 2014 was that you couldn't uh, issue a new lease because of other constraints, those constraints exist today. I think the very best you can do for these folks is not kick them out. Can we just, is the lease expires? Is there a language that just says it goes month to month automatically? Well, that, that's the law in California. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the status it, quo, and we, by by deferring it, it just goes to status quo. Right. So, in, in light of in light of uh, your feedback, Bill, uh, I won't uh, accept the uh, the friendly uh, language, friendly amendment. Okay. So, is there a second to the mayor? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Let's have a roll call. Councilmember Ferraro. Yes. Councilmember Bradley? Yes. Councilmember Dida? <clears throat> yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cruikshank? Yes. Cruikshank passes. Okay. okay. One. Next item. Okay. The next item is for consideration and possible action to amend exception category U of the city's landslide moratorium ordinance to clarify the allowable development on 48 Cinnamon Lane. Lake correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting regarding this item and we do not have any requests to speak. Okay, do my fellow council members need a staff report? Cause I don't. No. no. Okay, so let's waive the staff report. Uh, any questions of staff? No questions. No. Okay, is there a motion? I'll move approval of the um, recommendation to introduce ordinance number, I don't know the number, of the City of Rancho Palos Verdes amending section 15.20.040 of the City's landslide moratorium ordinance to allow residential development on 48 Cinnamon Lane. Second. Okay, motion is second. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call. And for the record, I will read the entire title of the ordinance. Thank you. So the motion will will include introduction of ordinance number six three three and ordinance of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. I know. Amending section 15.20.040, exceptions of the city's landslide moratorium ordinance to allow residential development on 48 Cinnamon Lane on the same terms as development associated with exceptions category T2. Council member Ferraro. Yes. Council member Dida. Yes. Council member Bradley. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria. Yes. Mayor Cruikshank. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. We can now move to our next item. The next item is for consideration <coughs> and possible action to receive a presentation on enhancing the aesthetics of Western Avenue. Late correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting regarding this item, and we do not have any requests to speak at this time. Okay. Uh, Nasser, do you have a quick uh, report, go ahead. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, before we jumped into this topic, and I know we're, we'll hear a brief staff presentation, but I just wanna say, I know we've received a lot of community feedback on this item. I think this is a really important item. Um, I feel a bit uncomfortable in not having this uh, exchange, you know, more, uh, you know, formally in person at a future council meeting. Uh, so although I'm certainly interested in getting the uh, staff report, 
uh, which I think we're all familiar uh, and maybe giving some general guidance to to staff. I, I, I do want to sort of upfront say I, I personally would want to have the opportunity for the, the many residents who've been invested in this issue in the past to have, you know, a more uh, in public opportunity to talk to us. Um, I want to make that statement before we start the topic. Are you thinking about continuing this to a future council meeting? I mean, is that what? Well, you're... I think we can hear the. I think we can hear the the brief staff report, and I think we can give some general guidance on next steps as we see it. So, so I don't. But I, but I do want to bring this back. I think I'm just conveying some level of discomfort uh, in trying to handle this very important topic uh, in the virtual f uh, fashion, and the desire, uh, maybe with some next steps from council to staff to bring this back in a form in which we'll have better opportunity for the public to to weigh in. I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I think that let's just get a very, very brief uh, overview of what has happened bef till now, but I, I'm with you. This needs to be a very robust discussion among our, our residents on the east side of town and, and not just them, but the entire city. Um, for consistency in that. Um, so I think we'll probably find that tonight's discussion, we probably won't get too far into the weeds. Maybe we could just give staff some thoughts and ideas. So Nasser, if you wanna give us a, a quick rundown of your presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and the city council. Um, this item is about the Western Avenue beautification options and the staff is recommending the following action to city council to review the potential design feature to enhance the uh, aesthetics of this Western Avenue uh, and provide staff direction as to the preferred design features. And if deemed uh, acceptable, um, direct staff to include the project in the upcoming CIP program uh, to compete for funding with other projects for design and construction. Over the years, the residents have provided feedback to the city regarding the, uh, the landscaping and the general aesthetic condition of the Western Avenue and the need for refurbishment. And the streetscape currently in includes uh, paved sidewalks, and then uh, concrete sidewalks and paved landscaping with planting pockets, which are not landscape, and then uh, some pine and palm trees. Western Avenue is the primary street corridor. Are, are the slides gonna advance, sir? I'm sorry. What? Okay, I'm gonna briefly explain and then, yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. And, <laughs> is the primary street corridor on the east side of the city. And this potential project focuses on a two mile stretch of the uh, street from PV Drive North on the north side uh, to the um, Summerland Avenue on the south. And the, the slides, the presentation includes some sample illustrations for the purpose of discussions only. Um, Okay, for example, some of the um, examples of the median uh, with some hardscape and some low level landscape and um, we're suggesting re replacing some of the pine trees with palm trees. Again, low maintenance uh, landscaping, uh, the median, but look somewhat different than what it is right now, which is mainly paved uh, median. And the entry sign, entry monument signs to the city, which these are some examples. And then um, again, median with the combination of hardscape and uh, low maintenance landscaping and narrow medians and uh, also decorated crosswalks and street pole with the banners. An example of uplighting 
which we recommend for the low voltage uplighting in the medians. And uh, some benches and trash receptacles. And basically, this is a summary of uh, the design features which we think is going to add to the enhancement of the aesthetics of Western Avenue. Uh, and this project is different than the North Shelf uh, Western Avenue Vision Plan, and also is different, is separate from the Western Avenue Traffic Congestion Improvement Project, which currently is in planning stage also, and we're co coordinating that with Caltran and City of Los Angeles. And uh, also this project was presented to IMAC committee in February 26, 2020, and uh, the members of IMAC members were in support of the project and recommended the project to be presented to the city council for consideration. We are estimating the design cost to be about $150,000. And then um, the construction depends on the design drawings and the plans. And uh, so we are seeking the city council, city council's direction in determining whether to include this project in the upcoming CIP program and also what design features the city council would like to include in the project overall. Thank you, and if there are any questions. Thank you, Nasser. Any questions of, uh, of Nasser? Looks like nobody has questions. Thank you Just so much. One. Oh, Just yeah, go ahead. Um, why are we going to put palm trees instead of the pine trees? Uh, we got a letter on that from, I think it was Barbara Sattler, who outlined all the reasons not to put palm trees in, from the maintenance to the fronds and the wind falling off and they do grow up to be tall and skinny and you know maybe when they're short they're they're pretty attractive but they look kind of like poles when they're after they've grown up a bit and aren't there some that we could use that would be um less i mean more drought resistant for one thing so that the maintenance would not be so um, oppressive for getting water to them. Um, and low growing that would provide actually some shade. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's just one thing I would look at. And the other sure. thing, I really like the design uh, crosswalks, the, the one with the, uh, I don't know, the wavy line. Yeah, mm -hmm. that top one. I really like that. Um, and the other picture on the left is, is a nice one of how you can put in plants that are also drought resistant and have a nice effect, but don't require as much maintenance. So those are just my comments. So the, yeah, to um, continue on this, uh, we, we will, you know, consider all the recommendations from the residents and the city council once we, the project is actually in design phase. Uh -huh. Right now, we are actually discussing different options and what we can include and what we shouldn't include uh, for the design features for this project. So once we, this project is in design phase, we will uh, include the public outreach meetings and all and we will pre make presentations again to City Council. Mm -hmm. well, overall, I like the idea. Thank you. I, I think so, it'll make a difference how Western Avenue looks. Yes, sir, how much can we actually do on Western right now? I mean, I, I know we're the lead agency for the project study report, but how does that even work for our city in terms of doing work on Western? Well, with, with this work, we need to uh, coordinate with Caltrans and city of Los Angeles um, and also the residents. But uh, obviously we need to coordinate this with Caltrans and city of Los Angeles because on the one side of the street, mainly we have the city of LA and then the other side is city of Rancho Palazuelos. And the Caltrans is also controlling the entire um, highway. 
and then we need, we need to coordinate this with other, also other projects, with traffic congestion improvement project. And then, um, so this is kind of early, but it has to be coordinated with Catherine. Okay, fair enough. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Council um, Councilor Mayor. Diana. Ken. Oh, okay. I heard two people talking, so I wasn't Thank sure. Uh, is what is Caltrans right of way on that street? Is it uh, from the inside edge of the sidewalk on both sides, like it is in the city, or is it different? I believe it, the the entire right of way. Does that include the sidewalks? I believe so. That is correct. Okay, so it includes the sidewalk. So even yes. things that we might want to do uh, on the sidewalk, like uh, uh, we'd have to coordinate with uh, Caltrans, the things like uh, burying the uh, utilities underground or whatever, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Does someone want to make a motion to extend new business beyond 1015? So uh, moved. Okay. Any objection? Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation, Nasser. One thing I want to do echo that you mentioned that I think is critical for our residents to understand, because I know there was a lot of feedback leading up to this item about the importance of prioritizing traffic. And so um, I want to just reemphasize what you said and, and what I know staff is repeating out to the community that that actually we absolutely agree uh, as a city and a council that the traffic is priority number one in that area. But it is being worked on it's on, I guess I would say, a three year trajectory on a syn traffic synchronization project that we are the lead agency in and working with um, you know, other agencies to accomplish. I don't think we need to wait on beautification. Um, so I'm glad this is in front of us. But I also uh, appreciate one of the common themes I heard from the residents, which was uh, they want whatever we do related to beautification to feel consistent with other areas of the city. So I would just say, you know, I like some of the creative ideas. I, it's you know, really need to see how some relatively minor improvements may have kind of a nice facelift experience. And I know we're all passionate about doing some things to, to uh, positively impact that important corridor for our city. So I'd say, you know, the idea of landscape, um, uh, medians, uh, the uplighting, uh, improved signage, all of those things are appealing to me. You know, one thing, of course, you heard the residents say in their feedback was the walls. So I would agree yes. and, and I would just ask that we incorporate um, similar to work we've done in other areas of the city as we've tried to unify, uh, you know, the, the look, um, even on the, the, the walls and dividers, private areas, uh, that we incorporate that somehow in this beautification project as we go forward. And Nasser, I think you you um, helped me in my thinking when you were talking about this being an initial step in the fact that we would engage um, the HOAs uh, as a as a potential next step. I don't know if we would have an, give you enough direction tonight to be able to accurately quantify a CIP project. Um, so I'm not sure how to proceed. Maybe I'll look to Ara and Elias for guidance. But I would just say. Uh, I definitely want to try to get this into our CIP budget by July, uh, but I also want to give you know our due diligence to allowing proper time for the uh, surrounding HOAs in our community to to weigh in on our thinking on this, as I mentioned earlier. So, sure. So I would uh, I would be well. I th I think I'll just leave it there for the moment and ask Ara, do you or Nasser or or Elias, do you, do you guys have feedback on how maybe we can accomplish all of that in the three, four months ahead of us um, based on what I've shared with you? Um, go ahead, Dara, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, you know, as we go through the budget season and we're looking at um, opportunities to fund some of these capital projects, you can clearly identify this as a project and put a price tag on it. We know 
um, moving forward to do some sort of design and, and just get a design plan, not the construction, but just the design is approximately $150,000. So, so to kind of, because it always is, is a, a couple steps, you can, you can fund and, and identify that as, as a, a top priority. And, and we could use this time to start uh, meeting with the residents, the HOAs, and getting feedback on what they would like to see. I mean, clearly what you're hearing um, with, with the re robust volume of, of responses is everyone's interested in doing something there. So, so this, this is the stepping stone. So, so it's seed money to get the ball rolling. Uh, yeah, to get us started with the design, and really, this agenda item is was intended to um, give you what the uh, the possibilities are, what you can do, and try to get you to visualize um, what Western Avenue could look like from from an aesthetic standpoint. I know there's there's overarching a couple tracks that we're taking with with Western Avenue. This is focusing on just the beautification, not the economic development nor the traffic flows, yeah. and to get you to give us some feedback, get some feedback from the community so we can give the designer uh, a better direction as to what to present to us for the for the community to consider rather than the designer just having um, designing something that's not Rancho Palos Verdes but is more suitable for for somewhere else. Okay, no, thank you, Art. Well, in, in light of that, and hopefully my commentary on the areas that I like, um, there's enough guidance to at least say, like we could put a placeholder as a CIP project with the expectation that we're gonna engage the uh, the surrounding HOAs uh, in the next couple of months and hopefully have a more a final uh, firm solid number going in to uh, July 1st, you know, prior to July 1st when we actually approve the CIP budget. If, is that, or is that enough direction to run with if I try to make a motion? Or do we need a motion for the design project part of it, the one hundred and fifty thousand? Not, not, not at this point. At this point, okay. really, this this item was just to give us some feedback on what you'd like to see, and and it would it's it's the beginning of the process. So I think that that's good feedback. Okay. okay. You know, one of the things that was mentioned was the undergrounding of utilities. And I think if that's possible, that would be a, a wonderful component. And the one thing I really liked about the crosswalks that, that I keep talking about is that can be, really be advantageous for safety as well, because it clearly delineates, you know, where people are going to walk. And yet it's very nice aesthetically as well. So I think that, that NASA's brought us some good pictures to, to go along with that would be good in Rancho PV. So um, if we can have honor, homeowners get together anytime soon, you know, um, but we have a lot of input from them, uh, from correspondence. So I think if you can take that all into consideration, we can come up with a good plan. Uh, and I hope we have lots of outreach to that community so that we get their feedback. Um, Councilman Dida. Yeah, uh, I think the fact of uh, doing something on the walls along that uh, on the RPV side, since in all probability those are on private property, is something that we can uh, pursue with the residents and the homeowners. I'm just concerned that if we spend all this money designing everything without Caltrans or somebody else's review and approval, uh, we may spend the money and then somebody else will say, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do something else. Uh, it's a coordination problem and it's difficult, but uh, if we don't do that, we run the risk of spending money on the design and having it just be you know, a sunk cost. So it sounds like we're gathering concepts versus doing a design, correct, Ara? Exactly. Okay. Uh, Councilman Bradley. Yeah, I read through a lot of the uh, late correspondence and uh, correspondence we've got over the last week on this. And I think there was an underlying theme that I encourage staff to go look at in that we need to take a look at the Western Avenue beautification um, project holistically. We need to look at walls. We need to look at utilities. 
We need to look at roads and we need to make sure that we don't have unintended consequences. Um, one of the things that came up several times was um, if we put additional benches in that area, that the benches could be used for other purposes than what we had originally intended. So I think we need to look at this from a holistic point of view. I uh, agree with uh, Councilmember Dida in that we need to also coordinate with Caltrans and the other agencies that are involved and come up with a holistic plan on how we're going to make the Western Avenue corridor more visually appealing, but we need to do it holistically and make sure we fix underlying issues as well as just um, attacking some uh, aesthetics. Agreed. And, and I'm sorry, Emily, did we need to give you a time in terms of when we're extending the meeting to? Yes, that, yes, I have it on there. There was not a time to extend the meeting. Okay, what time are you guys okay to 11 o'clock? That's fine okay. for me. Okay, so make that 11 o'clock. Um, and I agree with what Councilman Bradley just said. You know, this is such a critical part of our city. It's really a, an entry point. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to really start tying our our, our community together from all around all around the entire peninsula um, and a real opportunity I agree we, we shouldn't be spending money on things that are going to get ripped out in a few years uh, but I think we need to get the ball rolling and get the community's input on on what they want to see um, you know for me less is more I you know I, I like the way that Palos Verdes Drive uh, uh, south is um, where you have the low medians and it's very drought tolerant and and you can see and you don't have things blocking visuals. Um, and I also think we need to continue strongly on the wall removal slash replacement program that we've embarked on in Hawthorne. We need to continue that on Western. I think that's a something we can be doing. We don't need to necessarily re rely on Caltrans to, to do that because I think a lot of it's on uh, private property. Um, but I'd like to see that move ahead too. And of course, the undergrounding is always a big thing for me. And the more utilities we can get out of our visual uh, line of sight, the better. So uh, Mayor Pro Tem, did you make a motion? I did not, but I'll go ahead and make a motion uh, to proceed with staff recommendation and to put this in our CIP, again, with all the direction provided related to uh, public a public outreach program to follow. Caltrans. Say that again, Ken. Sorry. What about Caltrans? If we're going to talk about getting with getting together with the homeowners, we also need to get uh, with Caltrans so, uh, on anything we do in their right of way, because they may decide to do a different design, and that'll be a sunk cost again. I yeah, think certainly. the walls are something we can do if they're on private property, like right now. It'll show the community we're serious. It's something we can uh, establish and without Caltrans. And the rest of it, we should really work hard to get Caltrans and whoever else uh, to buy into what we're looking at as a beginning. Yeah, I, I agree with the point. I would say it's kind of assumed, I guess, uh, that the staff would be collaborating with them to ensure that any design we come up with would be consistent with um, and acceptable to, to Caltrans. So okay, I'll, I agree with the comment. I'll second that motion. Is there any further comment? Okay, seeing none, roll call. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Council Member Dida? Yes. Council Member Ferraro? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cookson? Yes. Motion passes. Next item. The next item for consideration and possible action to receive a presentation on options for powering EV charging stations at Hess Park. There are no requests to speak on this item. Okay, let's let's do a quick presentation, please. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we'll be present talking about options for powering EV charging stations at Hess Park uh, this evening. 
staff report uh, outlines essentially four options. Uh, AC power, which would just be directly uh, powering those through conduit underground, uh, a permanent carport with solar panels, um, same option with battery storage and temporary solar carport panels with EV charging stations. This item first came up as part of the options for improvements to the Hess Park parking lot design where we are adding 17 parking spaces where the hillside is now and EV charging stations would occupy uh, a number of those spaces. Uh, at the presentation back in April of last year, uh, council directed staff to include at least four charging stations and the, there's a recommendation from the Cal Green, um, California Green Building Standards Code uh, that would recommend not, I'm sorry, seven for a parking lot this size. So this is just showing the parking lot as it's being designed. This is showing the carport, that would be a solar carport there that would charge it for option number two. Option number three would be the same with battery backup. And option number four is uh, a temporary solution, which is uh, movable uh, temporary solar carports with EV charging stations. Uh, those could be moved, and but those could also be placed in those parking spots. And staff is looking for direction as the type of direction that uh, council would like us to uh, do further investigation you know, for the research or a complete design. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Short and sweet, very nice questions. Uh, yeah, Councilman Dida. Yeah, on the temporary carport, will that be sufficient electrical uh, generation for uh, an EV station? Uh, it does have um, a, a little bit of limitations as I've learned late. I talked to a consultant uh, late last week um, so the amount of power that it generates uh, is going to be enough to charge a significant amount of it uh, during the day, but it's gonna depend on the type of uh, EV charging stations that we occupy. Uh, the recommendation would be to still tie that into the electrical system, um, but the, the carport would largely cover uh, a lot of that. Okay, so it'll be tied into Southern Cal Edison, but with the solar panels providing as much power as they can, right? Absolutely. That'll make it more reliable, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Yes, Councilwoman. Um, who do we expect to use these charging stations? I mean, do we expect residents to come down and charge their cars there or? That's definitely, uh, some. the public would definitely be um, an option to, you know, would be the primary focus of that um, as a as part of the facility there at Hess Park. Uh, a number of things could be explored and we are exploring them as far as uh, actually charging uh, for that use uh, to reimburse uh, the city for the cost of installation as well as the uh, usage. And a number of those things are spelled out in the staff report. Uh, James, I have a couple of questions. Uh, back in June of last year, and I know we've had a change in staff, but I know Electrify America from VW were looking for locations and they were actually gonna be paying for the uh, stations. Do you know if uh, they were ever reached out to? And, and you probably don't, but do you know if they might still be offering that program? Unfortunately, I, I don't know personally, uh, but that's something that we can definitely look into to see. I know there's there were some options of programs uh, through Edison that have expired. Um, we have heard rumors that that may be uh, brought back in some form uh, or fashion, uh, but obviously we would be looking for any and all opportunities for grant funds or other funds that would, uh, that would you know, support that project. Okay, and, and I guess um, there's also a company called Green Lots that does these uh, charging stations as well. H have you been in contact with them? 
Uh, not green lots specifically, no. Uh, I have re uh, talked to a couple of different consultants um, and there's a lot of different companies out there and I think it's a, a fast emerging and growing industry. So I think there's a lot of different companies that are offering a lot of different things. And uh, what's available today um, might not have been available you know, back then and what could be available in a couple of months might not be available today. I mean, it's, it's a very quickly uh, emerging uh, industry, it seems. But would you would you say though that it would be recommended to go to these fast charging stations? Is that kind of where things are heading? Uh, well, it's spelled out in the staff report. Fast charging is an option. Um, the recommendation from the consultant that we had used through uh, through the COG was more of recommending more of a level two, uh, and that's kind of spelled out in some of the additional information uh, of the staff report. Uh, the primary focus of the staff report was to kind of look at some of what the powering options would be for this. Um, when we start talking into the type of charging stations, it can be a pretty involved uh, discussion very quickly, uh, whether it be fast charging, level two, level one, um, you know, the different manufacturers, uh, different type of pay rates and things of that nature. Um, so there's a lot that, that needs to be researched uh, on those levels. Staff was primarily just looking for some options to see if solar was uh, a direction that the council wanted us to do um, to pursue more, uh, or if it was just strictly more of uh, the AC power option. Uh, we did hear from, I forget the name of the other company that was providing the uh, temporary solution, which was the charging stations that uh, are movable as you see here on this slide. So it's kind of looking at a lot of different options, but we're trying to stay focused on just the, the powering options at this point, um, because there's so much else that needs to be, uh, so many other options that we need to do further research with. So so one of those stations would be roughly 80,000, is that? Uh, the initial estimate that I received was between 65 and $80,000 for a station like this, depending on the types of options. Uh, again, type of charging, um, and there's a number of software options and things of that nature. We, I didn't get into a whole lot of discussions with that because we were just kind of looking at seeing if this was something that the city even wanted to uh, entertain. But, but you're saying that with this, it's a temporary thing, so you could actually test the market out at Hess Park to see if people would be using it, correct? Uh, the My understanding of this is this is something that the city would purchase. Um, it's temporary in, in its installation. So arguably you could pick this up, you could move it to PVIC or you could move it to another facility, you could move it to another location within the, the Hess Park parking lot. It's it's temporary in, the, in that sense. Um, I'm not sure if it's something that it's just a case where we could try it out, um, but I would imagine that the vendor would would probably um, be willing to entertain those discussions. Other questions or comments? Yes, Councilman Dida. Yeah, the price you mentioned, is that for the solar panel system uh, in the temporary setup? For the temporary setup, the sixty-five dollars to $80,000 estimate would be for one of these temporary charging stations. Uh, cost estimates for the, the permanent uh, solar panel. Uh, I know that was spelled in the staff report. I think we were looking at here. Well, I, I have one comment. I just put in a uh, uh, solar panel smart electricity and tied it in with Southern Cal Edison and it did not cost me and I put a lot more panels up than with that temporary thing and didn't cost me no $60,000, I'll guarantee it. And the advantage of having the solar panels up there and tying into Southern Cal Edison is not only reliability, but should you generate more power than you use, you get a rebate. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I question that, that the cost of that uh, system because uh, in my mind, they saw you coming, I believe, because that's awfully expensive. My understanding is the sixty to sixty-five to eighty thousand dollar price tag for the temporary uh, setup that you see here is the cost of not just the solar panel but the structure itself and the EV charging station. It is a self-contained uh, system. 
Um, some of the things that are available on residential are not always available on the commercial side. So uh, wow. I'm not sure if we can do a, a apples to apples comparison on that on that side of it. Um, but I think primarily this is one of the few, if not possibly the only option where it is a self-contained uh, EV charging station that can be placed, you know, almost anywhere. Well, what you're doing is you're taking DC from the panels, converting it to AC uh, at the voltage required. So that's a, a uh, basically a transformation problem, uh, and then a connector. Now, in a in the private system, uh, you got solar panels, and it does the same thing. It converts it to 60 cycle, 120 volts. Uh, actually, in my case, it, it uh, converts it to 220. Uh, so uh, that's the three-prong system for cars, uh, and I put a heck of a lot more panels up than what you're showing here. Uh, so they're, they're, I think they're giving it a unique title, and you're paying a Cadillac price for a Chevy. Um, I, I'm not trying to promote this, you know, just showing it as one of the options. Um, I think this does include battery storage, um, and obviously there's the structural component. Um, well, that structural component, two posts on the panel, that's no big deal. And if you're going to go with this and tie it in with Southern Cal Edison, you don't need batteries. Mm -hmm. All right, Councilman Bradley. Yeah. Pardon? Um, I'm looking at this as well, and I, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, solar power and this. Do we know, um, uh, James, off the top of your head, how many uh, electric vehicle public charging um, slots are do we have within the city? Do we have any today? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Um, I didn't specifically look to see if that was a number. Um, there was a website that uh, I had looked at, which I think was plugshare.com, uh, which is a, a resource for uh, owners of electric vehicles to locate charging stations. I don't remember seeing anything on the peninsula, but I can't be certain of that. I mean, Terranea may have, and you're muted, Ara. Sarah Nea has them. Okay. All right, you're muted if you're talking to us. <laughs> yeah, yes, I am talking to you. Um, for Rancho Palos Verdes, the only sites that we have um, EV charging stations are at Marymount and Terra Nea. Okay. And they're not in any of our public facilities, and those are the only two locations. Okay. There Thank are you. some in Rolling Hills Estates up at the, um, the mall. Yes, and they and they actually have um, two charging stations at their city hall. Okay, um, so um, if you want a recommendation, my feelings on this is uh, the temporary or movable or portable system. Um, I don't think that's something we want to go down that path. It looks like it would be maintenance and subject to vandalism, and not a great way to go. But. I think we should invest, uh, in, investigate in fast charging for sure, um, solar for sure, and I am not a fan, uh, I think uh, similar to Councilman Dida about the battery option, but tying it into SoCal Edison and tying it into the normal grid, I think is the, it would be the way to go and investigate uh, doing a fixed um, site similar to what you have shown here at Hess Park, I think would be the most valuable for our our citizens, um, but also look at uh, public-private partnerships with some of these companies, like uh, Councilman Dida was talking about. Uh, folks will come in and put this, and then take a percentage of the power off as a as a rebate. So we need to look at some innovative ways to pay for this. Councilman Dida, yeah, uh, I put up twenty solar panels, and it cost me under thirty thousand dollars to install that system. It's tied to SCE, so you're using SCE power uh, all the time, and you're feeding uh, the power from the solar system after it's converted to uh, 60 cycle 220 and selling it back to SCE. And the net result is, at least in my case, you get money back. But uh, and it doesn't take batteries, and uh, I think if we're going to look at something, 
I agree with the comment made about putting in a permanent system, but let's take a look at uh, some innovative ways to do that without getting the kind of cost you're getting for that portable system. That That's, in my view, that's outrageous. I wonder if we should have a subcommittee on this with uh, Councilman Dida and Bradley. Yeah, I like that idea. Whoa, 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 whoa. Just because <laughs> Ken and I had ideas doesn't mean that we're a subcommittee now. <laughs> or maybe See, that, it does. That's what happens, Dave. You you make a good comment and all of a sudden you're responsible for a subcommittee. <laughs> I think staff can talking. do the work. And that's how I roll. <laughs> so I, I would actually like to make that motion to, to have a subcommittee work with the city staff and uh, take those recommendations that Councilman Bradley just mentioned. Um, I agree with all those comments. So that's my motion. Second. Any further discussion? Yes. Yeah, okay, Councilwoman Farrar. All right, I just, on the picture that's on our screen right now, what are the hash marks for? Is that also going to be some new parking places? In You're talking in this location yes. right here? Yes. Uh, that's the striping for uh, ADA parking. Oh, good. Because I know when they put in the um, electrical vehicle charging stations at the promenade, they took away some of the uh, handicap parking. And I didn't want us to do that in the park. But I see that you're actually gonna increase it by a couple of spaces, correct? Correct, and keep in mind that the uh, the project that kind of sparked this discussion includes adding 17 parking spaces where this solar panel is being shown. So- And would uh, those be available for parking even if they don't wanna charge? Uh, I think that's a discussion uh, Know, a topic of discussion when we get to that stage of of what kinds of uh, restrictions or options we want to have for the charging stations themselves. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. James, Elias, you guys are okay with working with our subcommittee and hashing this out? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, any other comment? Yes, Councilman Dida. Yeah, uh, since we're getting into the actual parking, I thought the council decided to take the trees out of the uh, center divider parking and put them all on the outside. Yeah, the for the that part for that project specifically, uh, it was primarily to eliminate all the tree wells in the parking lot and the uh, yeah. liability and hazards that go with that. Oh, so that's that's still part of the plan, right? That is part of that project. That project. This is okay. a, another project that would dovetail with that. That in parking, that parking lot improvement project, which also includes lighting improvements. So all of the trees are going to be removed. Uh, that, are, that are along um, with the um, where the no, cars are. They're they're being moved. They're uh, being moved to get out of the way of the cars. Yeah, I, I, when that was discussed uh, last year, uh, I believe the uh, understanding was that the trees could not actually be moved. Um, so it's simply a matter of removing the trees uh, and repaving the parking lot. But then putting new trees on yes. the outside of the parking lot. Right. Um, yes. Obviously, I don't have a, I wasn't prepared for this part of the discussion, but the that, that's what we're areas where outside of the parking lot already have considerable amount of trees. So I'm not sure how much you're not showing the entire parking lot. The others on the on the side toward the park. Exactly. We're, yeah. And I think and that's out of scope of the issue at hand. Exactly. We're getting out of scope. OK, so uh, Emily, are you clear on the motion? I, I can repeat it. Mayor and uh, Mayor Pro Tem are going to form a subcommittee, I think, is what the motion was. Yes, yes. yes. The city um, I do have part of the railroad. Um, give me just one moment. So what I have is um, motion um, motion by Mayor um, Cookshank, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Alegria, to create a subcommittee with staff and to incorporate Councilmember Bradley's suggestions. 
That's all I have. Uh, so this is basically what it is. So we want to receive and file the presentation on the options. That's the number one. Hmm. Number two, that the, the city council would create a uh, solar uh, subcommittee consisting of council member Dida and Bradley. And, and they um, would work with staff to develop the direction of these uh, EV charging stations. Okay. And is that to go towards researching option three, which was what staff recommendation was, the yes. permanent carport with battery storage? I, I'm not in favor of the battery storage. I think we need to look at the whole thing, so. Okay, but it's the permanent carport option. Yes. Yeah, look, look at the whole thing, like Councilman Bradley said. So that's the motion. Uh, roll, roll call. Council Member Bradley. Grudgingly, yes. <laughs> Council Member Dida. I succumb to the railroad, yes. <laughs> Council Member Faro. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria. Yes. Mayor Cruikshank. Happily, yes. Motion passes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, I guess we have what consent calendar items to go we back do. to. Right. Uh, so item H was pulled by Mayor Cruikshank and it'll be at the same time. Um, okay, I'll make this very quick. So basically we're, uh, this is to approve the clean street amendment extend um, for, for it's, this is for the street sweeping. And what I thought we could potentially add is we, I've heard some residents actually talk about how because cars are not restricted to park on the street, uh, when the street cleaner comes around, they have to swing around a whole bunch of cars and they miss a whole bunch of areas with dirt and debris. And so yep. our, our uh, street sweeping is not very efficient like other cities where you'll have a restriction for a day for a few hours and they can actually get in and street sweep the entire street versus uh, missing a portion of it. So I was thinking maybe we could try a pilot uh, location um, uh, I know the people at Oceanfront Estates said that they would like to see restrictions during uh, street sweeping to make sure that their entire street gets uh, swept. So that's what I, I wanted to add that to this, uh, uh, what we're doing here so that we can start seeing how that works. Is that is that work for the city staff, Ara? We can certainly explore um, doing that as a pilot program at Oceanfront Estates. Okay, so I that's, think that's all there, I had fine. There, there may be a cost associated with um, with having to do that and perhaps having some enforcement there to make it more, um, have some teeth to it, but we'll we'll look into it and see what we could do as a pilot program. Okay, so you'll just bring there back we, what that would look like as a pilot program. It, no, requires, sure. it requires signage as well as enforcement. Correct. Okay. Any other comments? So basically, we would just add that to the recommended council action. As a directive to staff. Exactly. Okay. So, we, we move so we're, we're approving the the amendment right. as is and as a second. With, with a direction for staff to explore and bring back a pilot program. Got it. Thank you. Do you need a motion for that? Uh, well, I, I'm making that motion, but I do need a second. I'll second it. Okay. Okay, uh, any other comments? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, are you just scratching your nose? Just scratched my head. Okay, great. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Council Member Dida? Yes. Council Member Ferraro? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cookshank? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, our next item is another pooled consent item, which was pulled by council member Bradley was item L, consideration and possible action to approve fiscal year 2020, 2021 city council goals. We have no request to speak or any late correspondence on this item. Dave, you have the floor. Yeah, the reason I wanted this pulled was the one thing I didn't see in the uh, staff report 
was uh, the change in when uh, the goals were going to be status to council as opposed to doing it monthly. I think we talked about doing it quarterly and I wanted to uh, memorialize that, that we want to see the goals come back by the department heads on a quarterly basis to status our progress and to uh, potentially revector city staff if we see something uh, going uh, differently than we had envisioned. A absolutely, Councilman Bradley. Um, we intend to bring this back as um, agenda item on, on regular business as every quarter. So it's not gonna be um, a consent item or just a receive and file item. Okay, that's that was my that was my addition to that item uh, for direction for that was okay, so we're memorializing. So that's a motion by the council member. Is there a second? Second. Okay. That motion was to uh, consideration possible action to approve city council goals and report quarterly. Yes. Is that the motion? That is the motion. Okay. Yes. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. The second came from Mayor Pro Tem Alegria, correct? That's correct. correct. Council Member Bradley? Yes. Council Member Dida? Yes. Council Member Ferraro? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Alegria? Yes. Mayor Cruikshank? Yes. Motion passes. With that, we can move on to um, future agenda items. Any future agenda items for my colleagues? Seeing none, uh, city council oral reports. Councilman Dida. Uh, held a meeting with ACLAD uh, this past Wednesday uh, and the reports were that uh, uh, we have no indication, no report rather, as to the status of the uh, uh, water table uh, the last we had was it was increasing, uh, and that's about the only thing we had a report we had discussed at the meeting. The rest uh, was a call for a hearing to go over the uh, next fiscal year's budget. And that's all that was talked about. Thank you, Councilman Bradley. Uh, yeah, uh, last weekend I had the pleasure of attending uh, the um, Contract City Sheriff's Academy downtown at the Hall of Justice. Uh, the Sheriff's Department put on a wonderful event for us. It was very informative. Unfortunately, it was not highly attended. Most of the people um, that had signed up did not show. So it became a very focused about the Lamita Sheriff Station because the only people that were there were myself and the city manager from Lamita. So uh, it was all about the Lamita Sheriff Station. But uh, I wanted to uh, thank Captain Powers and the rest of the LA Sheriff's Department for the uh, first in the, uh, the Sheriff's Academy. It was very well done. I uh, had some great discussions on um, sheriff liability and how the liability fund is uh, structured and some other things for the um, Sheriff's Academy. So if anybody has an opportunity to attend the Contract City Sheriff's Academy, I highly recommend it. I did it. When, when we're brought out of quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Councilwoman Ferraro. Just a couple of things. First, you know, I know people have heard so much about this com coronavirus and I just encourage everybody to use common sense stay safe our schools are closed right now and I just want to give a shout out to my kids how much I miss them already I know they're so glad to be out of school but it wears thin after a while they're going to find out but uh, take care of themselves and the other thing is just kudos to the staff for tonight and making this meeting possible and everybody did so well and especially to Ara because boy what these crazy times that we're in now and we're so glad to have him as the manager city manager that's it well said thank you Barbara Mayor Pro Tem uh, yes uh, March 11th uh, you and I met with the mayor Mayor Pro Tem of Rolling Hills is part of our ongoing tour of the peninsula. Uh, and then on March 16th, we met with 
the uh, we had a call with the uh, mayor, Mayor Pro Tem of Rolling Hills Estates to continue on our, our ongoing dialogue. And then uh, I'll mention on uh, March 14th, the UI and the city manager had, I would call it, I guess, a coronavirus uh, coordination call uh, to to coordinate uh, uh, our outreach and some of the efforts around that. Um, uh, Barb, you said it well a minute ago. A great job to staff tonight for pulling this together, and great job to our mayor for coordinating a very challenging, uh, very challenging meeting, virtual meeting, which I thought went rather well. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. That that means a lot, and and I, I appreciate you all being on the uh, council meeting tonight. I I told Ara that it's important that we continue to show that we're we're here and we're we're here for the people in our our community. Um, and so even though this was probably very choppy and not, not as smooth, I think it at least shows that, that we're here and we're working. So uh, thank you, Ara, and your, all your staff and to my council members. Um, I thought tonight went amazingly well and we're actually gonna finish right before 11. So with that, I believe we can adjourn the meeting. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night.